So if you try and draw the ice sheet and you have it going all the way from New York straight across through like South Dakota and into like Idaho and then across into like Oregon, that's bull crap. That's not what the ice sheet looked like, right? It, it curved up into Alberta. It's really obvious where those glaciers came, right? They're completely off skelter. They're, they're centered on Greenland in a way that when you look at it in 3D, it's so obvious that the only plausible answer is that there was a, a different North Pole during the Ice Age. One of the reasons I think people love Graham Hancock and... It's because he's like such an amazing talker. What's the other guy's name? Car- Randall, Carlson? Randall Carlson. Randall Carlson, Graham Hancock. They love these guys because they can string ideas together in a way that's understandable to people. And they are willing to entertain possibilities. And most exacting scientific folks are really, really worried about entertaining possibilities other than the ones that have been established by their forefathers. And geology is such a discipline of stories, right? Because the only you the the chemical content of a rock or the position of a rock or where you or what you find in the rock is not necessarily that interesting unless you can tell a story of the larger picture that it is a part of. And so one of the things that was really amazing about this conversation with Lance Weaver from the Utah Geological Survey was that he's able to tell a story about something that everybody kind of figures that they understand. The Ice Age happened differently from what we're told. And Lance has a very complete picture of why that is, and it's very convincing. The the evidence is apparent. It is woven together into a story that goes from beginning, middle, and end. There is an explanation for how it's possible that we've missed these things. And I I don't know. It's just, it's, it's it's one of our top theories. We got astronomical physics, electric universe, everything being tied into this picture. And yeah, Lance does a great job of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The pole shifted. The ice ages are not what you think they are. Lance Weaver has the story. Please, please come over and support us on Patreon. Your word of mouth is the thing that will make us grow the most. So tell everybody you know about the Demystify Sci podcast. And if there's somebody you want to see us talk to, please drop us a line. There's millions of places to get in touch with us. Get out there. Find people. Literally millions. Millions. There's an infinite number of possibilities for how you can contact us. We are that available. Telepathy. So bring us people and we will try to get to the bottom of how things work. In the meantime, enjoy our conversation with Lance Weaver. The scientific revolution starts now. Are you mostly a field geologist or mostly an office geologist or a mix of both? Um, like my, my current job, definitely mostly an office geologist, but then where I have my kind of side hustle tour business, I could say that does quite a bit of field geology. And then I, I have little seasons, like both from my personal website and at work where I'm trying to compile kind of like a virtual field trip of Utah. Um, so then I've been kind of going out in the field <clears throat> a lot more just to record basically it's roadside geology books on video, right? So I have kind of like this vision of, of doing most of Utah where, where someone can drive in a car and they can just either listen to me or watch YouTube videos where I'm explaining all the geology of Utah in person. Where do you get all the narratives that, that you're sharing with folks? Like, is it stuff that you have learned through your own research or is it is it uh, a lot of the stories that you inherited from your undergraduate? And yeah, like wh- wh- how, do you, how do you tell somebody about the history of the earth when, you know, there's so many moving parts and how does that work? I mean, because my, all, all of my narratives are, such, are so location-based, you know, it's basically I'm traveling to places that are popular, like most of Utah, really. And, and in my tours at Zion National Park, and so then I'm trying to tell them about this spe- specific location, but because I grew up there, you know, I've been thinking about the geology of that place for, you know, 20 years. 
And so I, I know a lot about it. Okay, so I actually have a question. There's a bunch of really weird red rock formations in the Southwest, like the Grand Canyon, part of the Grand Canyon, uh, Sedona, then Zion, Bryce. Are they related to one another? So the Grand Staircase, what makes it so famous, right, is because you've got rocks that you can follow stratigraphically all the way from Arizona to really in Wyoming. And so some of those rocks are related and some of them aren't. But essentially, Sedona sits in the Permian. So most of the Sedona layers uh, are roughly equivalent to the kind of the top layers of the Grand Canyon, even though they're largely different color. Um, but then as you move into Zion, you move up stratigraphically in the section. And so Zion, the bottom of Zion starts at the top of the Grand Canyon, right? And then you move all the way up through the Mesozoic in Zion. And then the top of Zion is essentially the bottom of Bryce. Right, so you've got a continual stratigraphic le- uh, record going from essentially, like we talked about before, you know, the bottom of the Grand Canyon, a billion years ago, you know, to you know, thirty to fifty-five million years ago at the top of Bryce. And those are those all like stratigraphic dates based on fossils, or they're they're from like the zircon radiometric stuff, or geologists use every tool, yeah, in their arsenal. And so, I mean, you can't you can't absolute date a fossil. But you can take a fossil somewhere else, you know, and find a layer that it's in and then find some kind of zircon or, you know, something that you can potassium argon date or argon argon date. And then you can apply that same fossil wherever you find it. So, so yeah, every date is based on an absolute dating method, even if it's using fossils, if that makes sense. With like the assumption that those fossils didn't, or like those organisms didn't change shape very much or something like that. Right, right. I mean, they're trying to pick out a, a specific species, you know, and they've, you're, you're assuming that the, the differences that you see in the species in this region um, are evolutionarily caused and are constrained by a certain time slice, and that that holds true in the other region that you find those species. It's, it's pretty freaking wild, though, how some organisms just don't change, right? Like sharks and crocodiles and... Yeah. It's, it's very strange to me how, how some, some animals just seem to find a little... Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. They they find their role and they just stick to it. I was actually thinking more about the like the human difficulties of this, which is that so we're doing this uh we're doing this episode about expanding or expansion tectonics or on expanding earth channel. on our other channel. And I was like, okay, well so we know that there's continuity of fossils from South America to Africa. And I think with Australia and like you see those charts where you're like, there's this band of fossils. And I was like, well, so if you're living on a smaller earth then you would expand, uh, you would expect there to be a, con- a continuous band of fossils in the other direction as well, unless there's like an open ocean there. And I started digging and I started trying to figure out what the fossil records were for each place. And I was very frustrated by discovering that there wasn't a neat collection of like fossil tables of all of the objects that had ever been found. I was like, this seems like a PhD level worth of research, like years of tabulating charts and figuring it. Cause there's like shales in Canada and there's shales in China and they have all of this, you know, huge amount of organisms and each of them are named slightly differently because different groups are naming them and you can't tell if they're comparing them to one another in order to be able to tell that this is like one kind of sponge versus another kind of sponge it just seems very for I mean, being the for whole being defi- rocks and fossils it feels very squishy and like drawing the line between different species is a whole other problem and is like it, what's a species anyways well that's that's a that's a longer deeper conversation with like with something like the red rocks of sedona and zion and the grand canyon they're very they're very layered in terms of color is there is there an explanation for that that you're satisfied with no absolutely but don't be fooled by color interesting Mm. don't use color to classify rocks it's a horrible classification because the exact same layer so let's take zion for instance like talk about the navajo sandstone which is a star of every national park in utah essentially Right. You in one area, it'll be deep red, but that exact same lithological layer, you follow it over and it'll be white in another area. And on the top will be white, the bottom will be red. So and and there's people who've done like some really great work, like the University of Utah has um, like Margie Chan, some of her grad students have done amazing work on trying to figure out exactly what causes the color. Right. And it's it's minerals, obviously, like hematite, uh, maybe illite, a couple other iron bearing minerals. 
But what's crazy about it is it, it's really small differences in the amount of that mineral that control the rock color. So like you might have interstitial um, cementation that has like hematite in it in, in the Navajo sandstone, for instance, and it's deep red because there's like, I wish I could remember the exact numbers, but it was like maybe one rock sample has 3% hematite content in that cement that's coloring the rock red. In another area, it's one and a half instead of 3% and it's white. So a percent and a Humans half. are really sensitive to color, it seems like. I, I read somewhere like this unbelievable differentiation ability that we have, which kind of makes sense if you think about it, because we see such a tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we would be really sensitive within that little range. But uh, it seems like this is like if you're if the difference, it, it's not like the difference between like multiple different colors of red. It seems like the difference is between like this has deep red and this is no red at all. It's like pinkish or something. I mean, there's like white chunks like at the top of Thunder Mountain in Sedona. It's just white. Yeah, and same design. The top's totally white. Right. So like there's yeah. definitely something. And is it, so is it So there's other processes besides just the scouring, like the thing was homogenous in the first place before it got chopped down to these layers. So, that, so for instance, here, um, a good example of the color, just as a basis for the whole science of color, like most of these sandstones, at least, are white quartz sandstones. So the cons what, what's being, what it's being made of is a white quartz, right? The rock itself. And then you've got white cementation, but it's just a small amount of hematite mineralization within that cement that gives it all its color and that's something that that drips down into it can you can you explain that process or like where does it come from in the first place or is it yeah, mineralization in yeah. time no it's it's usually happening like depositionally like a sin deposition right as the deposition occurs so then picture like for instance um the amazon river right and if you've ever seen like the different branches of the amazon river some of them run kind of clear and some of them run bright red Right, it's it's in those river systems that are actually depositing the sand, where the coloration is happening. Hmm. Right, so there's a river? individual. Indi there was when they were deposited. Right, so like usually, so we as geologists have to figure out the difference between whether it's being fluvial, you know, a, a river deposited environment, or whether it's an ocean marine or near marine environment. But in in general, so that like this is like my tours, it kind of comes alive. If, if I'm walking down an outcrop and I'm kind of like showing you bit by bit to be like, look, this is how we understand this is a river. This is how we understand this is actually a massive Eolian sand dune system. This is how we understand this is a near marine system. But as a general rule, um, sands are beach environments, right? Really well-sorted sands are beach environments or they're desert sand dune environments. Um, muds and clays are going to be deposited either in giant river systems or kind of like back lagoon systems. Limestones are going to be deposited um, in shallow marine environments with high evaporation. And so you can piece together environments just by kind of knowing those general rules. And if you were to go on Google Earth, you'd see it, right? You go to the Mississippi Delta, you can see what's being deposited where. You can go to the Sahara Desert. Anyway, and then you kind of get... And I wish you could come out here and give us a tour of our own uh, geology because we got sand on top of the mountains here that just drives us nuts. We're like... How did this possibly happen? Yeah, there's so we we live in a really weird geological area. So it is there's a couple of rivers, but they're relatively small. But you can tell that they used to be much bigger. So the place where we live right now, we're digging fence post holes, and so it's like three feet down. It's just clay, clay with river rocks, which makes sense. I guess which makes sense, like river bottom. Okay, sure. But then you walk a mile from our house, and you end up on these hills, and they're this fine gray crystalline sand like it looks like quartz almost and it's nothing like whitish else gray. yeah it's like a whitish gray and nothing else is made of there and there's almost no topsoil in it like the topsoil layer is super thin but there's not a history of recent geological catastrophe here and you're in the northwest somewhere mm -hmm, like right around the california oregon border like a couple hours to the west of crater lake yeah you know what so if it, it, it sucks doing geology up there because everything's covered with trees it's way easier down here. But if you can get rid of the trees, you know, and actually find the deposits, then you could you could follow an ancient river system, you know, and, and different river systems are going to have like, you can just go to a river and picture how it's like you've got a cut bank and in the cut bank, it's eroding. And then in the inside of the meander, it's actually depositing sands. But then there's over bank deposits whenever it floods and that's all muds. And, and we can actually find these ancient river systems and follow them. Um, 
and it's kind of easy when they're brand new, probably like where you live, these are probably like Miocene um, or even more recent deposits, you know, or like, for instance, where I live, you've got stuff like uh, the Morrison formation has amazing 220, you know, um, Jurassic aged um, rivers. And, and they're just like, you can follow them. You can actually see them in satellite images meandering along the landscape. And yet this thing was buried by 10,000 feet of sediment and that has been eroded. And now we're seeing exactly what the ancient river looked like. And that's like the most amazing thing about being in the desert. Like we've been in Sedona and Southern California and all those areas and you walk around and you're struck by how different the place once was, right? You're walking along a wash of some kind and it's not a river that could have possibly been there in the it feels like it couldn't have been in the in the time span of human civilization even. Or you think about Mesopotamia, you know, the birthplace of civilization. And it's like, you know, you've seen Iraq lately, right? I think like the most prosperous ancient city, uh, Nineveh, is, has been leveled recently. And, and, the, and it's just a, a burning pit of, you know. Look upon my works, ye <laughs> mighty in despair, right? Yeah, yeah, but at some point it was it was a complete, you know, it was the fertile crescent. And that wasn't even that long ago. Right. I mean, it's, it's, so we're talking about different time scales here because it still is kind of the fertile crescent, you know, and that, and all of those ruins that we're talking about, those are super recent, yep, you know, yep, in yep. the last couple of thousands of years. <laughs> Sorry, we don't, we don't, we don't talk to geologists that often. <laughs> <laughs> but so like a good example, instead of Nineveh would be like, Ur, you know, like some of these um, big cities that we know are actually on the coast and that it now are, uh, what is the hugest ruin, the Sumerian ruin? It's it's something like sixty miles from the ocean right now, but yet it was on the coast four thousand BC when it was at its height, you know. And so that delta is either built out by fifty miles by sediment pouring down the Tigris and Euphrates, or else by you know currents reworking the shoreline. But that's 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 a lot of change, and you see the same thing in, in such little time. Yeah, yeah. But then when we're talking about places like Sedona, I mean, here we're talking about Permian aged. I think we just we have such a hard time wrapping our minds around those those kind of time scales. It's just it's really really hard for me to to do just to imagine. I mean, I can sort of imagine five thousand years, but you talk about a million years, and I'm like, I just don't even I can't even calculate. I don't know. Just my brain just seizes up. It's like it just becomes a long time ago at some point for me. <laughs> I mean, do you think that the forces that changed? the landscape in a place like the American Southwest and the forces that changed the landscape in the Middle East were the same forces, but just acting at different times? Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. The exact same processes, I think, are working all over the earth. But whether you live on like a convergent plate boundary <clears throat> where the land might be raising, you know, a millimeter every year versus whether you live in a, like uh, a basin that's actually subsiding a millimeter a year, you're going to have super different environments right Does that makes sense like if you're living in a mountain chain versus someplace that's subsiding if you're living in the rocky mountains versus the entire stretch from the black sea into kazakhstan and eastern china mm -hmm. um, or western china they're so different like so different one of them is like stacking sediment up and what the other one's eroding it away and as a so I, like paleomorphology is kind of like one of my specialties so if you're a paleomorphologist you're trying to piece together history by looking at exactly what's been deposited and, and reconstructing the past by what you see, right? Walking from the bottom of the Grand Canyon to the top of Bryce, the entire Grand Staircase, and piecing together every single year. And then in my mind, the big one with me is like, I, I want to deconstruct everything that's been taught to me and actually see it. I don't want to believe, I don't want to take anyone's word for anything. I love that. Walk through that sedimentary layer and be like, could this have happened in 7,000 years? Could this have happened in 10 million years? Did it actually take a billion years? Have you seen a lot of change? I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna uh I was gonna pop onto my favorite topic of the great unconformity in the Grand Canyon, but go ahead. Well we, we yeah, we can we could do that. I, I'm just curious how much it's changed in your lifetime. I mean, you haven't been out of school. You're a young guy, like it hasn't been that long, but I'm sure some things have changed. Um are are geologists around you uh coming up with new interpretations of that uh, when they go on those walks and having any success in convincing the old guard that maybe the stories need to be updated to some extent? Or is it pretty much just the same stories as 10 years ago? 
I, I think it's probably pretty much the same. Um, so yeah, we, we have so many topics we should cover because that opens up just a whole can of worms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to say, I, I've, I came across your uh, website, just for everybody who's listening. Uh, I was researching the, well, really just crustal dynamics and uh, the pot- possibility of pole shifts in the past for this movie that we're working on out of our sister channel, Demystify Psy. And I found this blog which suggested that pole shifts might account for the ice ages, or I guess the glaciations. Um, the, the ice ages are technically these huge spans of multiple glaciations, from what I understand. But you were essentially uh, promoting this idea that I really hadn't heard from anybody uh, within the, let's say, academic superstructures, or or uh, with within the mainstream. Let's just let's just call it that. Um, and so I started reading, and it's just this beautiful blog. You've done these really incredible simulations. Um, we'll put it in the show notes, and everybody needs to go and look at it right this second. They're, they're these interactive... UtahGeology.com. There you go. Uh, and yeah, just search for Lance uh, Weaver, and you will find this blog. And it is, a, it is an idea that I have encountered before, but the way that it's laid out is just really fascinating. Well, the idea being that the pole has actually shifted. It's like the ice ages are not a result of some kind of weirdly shaped glaciation that just kind of covered the entire Earth or snowball Earth or whatever people imagine in their minds. It's the fact that the actual extent of the ice cover went from being centered on the modern North Pole to being centered on a North Pole that is much farther south on the Greenland ice sheet. Right. Yeah, how, did, how did this all start for you? This sounds like paleomorphology may have played a role. Yeah, so I mean, this is all stuff that I saw... <clears throat> for the first time when I was in school, right? And, and so like I mentioned before, like when I was in school, I I didn't really, I, I was really keenly aware because of, you know, where I was raised and kind of the religions that exist in Utah, really, um, of this huge debate between creationists and uniformitarianists, right? And so I kind of had like these two different groups pulling on me. Um, so then when I entered into geology, it was like, well, I want to know, I want to know which one is, true <laughs> like is there any possibility that creationism is creationism is viable um and like i say so so i'm going to get to it but like uniformitarianism definitely won me over um but i super appreciate creationism mm. and the reason why i appreciate it is because i think it made me a far better geologist um whereas i saw most of my colleagues in school just kind of like believing what they were taught they're like you know just little robots you know these little 18, 19, 20 year old kids eating up everything that the teacher says. Like, I didn't believe a thing that any of my teachers taught me unless I saw the evidence myself. Right. Because I was, it was because of those two completely polarized worldviews that it made me, I think, into a true scientist. And what I can, can you just scientist. explain uniformitarianism? It might seem really obvious to you, but I, I think I need a refresher on it exactly. It's like the idea that nothing's changed since the inception of the earth or something. The f- I think that it's the forces that are at play oh, okay, now okay, okay. are the forces that have always been at play and that there's not some like mysterious thing that could have happened. Yeah. And, and it's like those two polarized worldviews emerged out of the post medieval period where you had the majority of scientists were essentially religionists. Right. And so all through the medieval period, the, wor- the world was thought to be like they interpret the Bible to say 7,000 years old or maybe 14 or some, some very small number, you know. And so those are creationists. Uniformitarianism grew out of kind of, kind of people seeing that, that things had to be older. Hmm. Right. And that the Bible, well, first, you know, when they saw a shelf on top of the mountain, you know, in the Alps or something, Hutton, Lyell, like all these early geologic pioneers kind of that the people before them thought, Oh, this is Noah's flood. Right. So the flood like flooded the earth and that's how we get fossils or shells at the top of the Alps and top of mountains. But as people looked at geology more closely doing exactly what I, what I say I do, you know, with the Southwest, they're like, no, that just doesn't fit. Like these, these shells are in situ. They look like there's not, there's not flood that this is because they're in a, they're in a beach environment. Like I can see the beach sands. I can see ripple marks 
from from where the beach made ripples on the on the buried sand, and I can see all these fossils and footprints. How can there be footprints with the fossils with everything together that just doesn't fit with the biblical narrative? And so the uniformitarianism was the idea that it's like, no, you know, what? I think that the exact same processes that are happening on Earth today were happening long periods of times ago, and they are what deposited these things, and then somehow they got up on top of a mountain. And so then you had to get play tectonics involved in that. It's like, well, how did we elevate all of these formations and turn them from beach environments to mountains, right? And so then entire entire new worldview um, was created in opposition to the biblical worldview. And, and that debate still exists today, um, as, except for that the, the vast majority of rational um, people have accepted, you know, the uniformitarian worldview that it's like, no, these are it's just- wild how new of a debate this is actually like, I think I, I read that the idea of glaciation causing moraine fields that were long spoken about in Europe was introduced into the academy in the 1800s. Like this is only this idea that there may be these long-term processes shaping the earth, uh, it's relatively new. And they keep yeah. pushing the time scales back too. For, I saw an article this morning, I try to look through the this pop sci headlines every morning and I, I saw that uh the cosmologists are, are sort of getting together and talking about maybe moving the date of the you know birth of the universe back a little bit because some things aren't making sense and you know that seems to have been happening in geology you know steadily since since really since these uh, uniformitarian processes were seriously considered yeah so like how did they decide that it had to be older than 6,000 years, right? Because I'm like, okay, so you get to the point where you're like, there's a beach here. F- crazy, but there was a beach here. Right. But it was here within the last 6,000 years. Like, is that the compromise that they made at first? Or did they directly go into being like, you know what, I think it's far weirder than we say. Yeah, I think that from early on, um, right? I mean, Darwin basically was a student of Lyell and Lyell with Hutton are kind of the fathers of geology. This all happened like in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Um, by then they realized that we need millions of years. And Just I, because and I hope- they like knew how long it take for something to get de- like deposited. So if you're looking at a mudstone and you know about how much mud is being deposited by a river, yeah, you can extrapolate outwards to be like, well, this thick layer of mud had to have taken X number of years. Yeah. And honestly, when it comes to deposition, like deposition doesn't require millions of years. In fact, a lot of depositional environments are arguments against millions of years, right? And we'll get into radiometric dating later because that's kind of our our main staple for coming up with millions of years. But like, let's take like the Ganges and Bahama Putra, like any major Mississippi, any huge depositional environment where you've just got massive amounts of sediment coming into the ocean, right? It's not uncommon in some of those sedimentary environments or deposition environments to get like a centimeter of of sediment being deposited over like you know tens of square miles maybe even hundreds of square miles a year yeah like the the mountain because the the himalayan mountains in the north of india are basically dissolving and all of that sediment is getting carried out by those rivers and so you can actually see it like when you look at a topographic map of india that by the time that you get to the southern tip there's actually geological or uh terrain relief but in the north it's basically this flatland and you can see the flatland extending down into the water and then if you look at sediment maps the ocean floor has almost no sediment on it relative to these continental shelves that i think that the the indian delta area i think it's the bay of bengal is like 20 kilometers of sediment yeah like um, enormous amounts of sediment are causing these deltas to prograde noticeably every year and that's just like what I was talking about with the cities of Sumer uh, and Akkad, you know, like in the Mesopotamian area, like the, the shoreline is moving outward. There's, there's forts on the Mississippi River that used to be right by the river and, and by the Delta that now the Delta has prograded, you know, and every, every one of them is different and they're going like this, you know, but it, you get a lot of sediment building out these deltas mm-hmm. every year. And if you were to multiply, you do the math, like, let's say that, that the Delta, let's use like the, the Euphrates and Tigris as an example. Let's say that that Delta is prograding, building itself out into the ocean at a inch a year. And that's probably not an unrealistic number, even though I haven't looked into what the actual number is. It could be much higher. Um, 
So then let's times that by 10 million. You know, what is 10 million times an inch? I believe it's 10 million inches. <laughs> <laughs> you said you weren't very good at math. You know, I, I have my moments. It is 157.8 miles. That's, that's a lot. And when we, when we talk about the depth even, let's say that like in the entire deltaic region, you're building an inch of sediment a year, you know, now in 10 million years, you've got 157 miles deep of sediment. Well, there's, there's nowhere on earth that has 157 miles deep of sediment that, right. That would be down into the mantle. Um, And where's all that water displacement go to? I mean, it's displacing some volume of water every year too, right? So it's almost like the shore has to be encroaching on on land somewhere else. Well, or- not, not necessarily because actually the crust, right, is pretty buoyant essentially in the asthenosphere and mantle. So when you get a, b- a big amount of sediment on it, it actually depresses the crust. Down this is isostasy? Yeah, yeah. Isos- isostasy is essentially the exact same principle, especially when you get isostatic rebound. But anyway, you get depositional environments that sink and, and there are places on earth that have like a good 50,000 feet of sediment. And how did you, how did you create an accommodation space for 50,000 feet of sediment, right? You actually depressed the crust and stacked it up. Okay. So that, but that's getting into the weeds. So my well, not is- necessarily because if you depress the crust and you stack it up, you're shifting the balance of the earth. Yeah. You're shifting mass for sure. For sure. Yeah. You, you just don't necessarily have to be changing sea level or anything like that because it's happening. That is, I mean, I think that, that I think that that's interesting just to like file away because I, I, I have a very poor understand, poor grasp of the earth system and how it changes. Well, ultimately, when we get around to talking about crustal displacement or pole shift, we, we need to find some sort of mechanism for what could cause that to happen. And, and obviously Hapgood had his mechanism, which was entertained, but then... You know, I think. What was Hapgood's mechanism? Uh, well, I, I think Einstein played with this too. Just that uh, the what was it like? The ice would build up sort sort of on one side, and if it got slightly lopsided, it would just all of a sudden pull everything in one direction. You know, there was like some some imbalance of the angular momentum due to the ice accumulation. Is, is that is that right? Um, you know, but later they calculate. You know, people went over the calculations and and were like, "Nah, it wasn't. It wouldn't be enough to do it." And yeah, there's lots of problems. With, and I haven't really like. It's been a long time since I've even read any of Hapgood's stuff. Um, and even when I did, I didn't find it as convincing as other thoughts. But anyway, yeah. So what the 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 driving mechanism for all these things is going to be huge. I guess we got to get through the history of it, and then we'll talk about possibilities yeah. of of, all, of what could possibly be different than what the mainstream has come up with. I, I think suffice to say, the mainstream model for age, right, and for deposition for uniform materials in, gen- in general, is much better than the creationist model. Okay, and I right, and I and I want to try and like I, I want to try and be fair because I want I'm, I'm not one to just bash on creationists. Um, and I, and they have a lot of good points, right? But their models lack. They'll find out where you live. You're in Utah, man. <laughs> you better not bash them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't even know if there's really that many anymore, but like I said, so I think, I think it's an important, it's important people. It's important thing to have like fringe scientists who don't believe in the status quo, because that's kind of what progresses and uncovers the major mistakes that might exist in our models. Well, it's funny too because I've been uh, I've been investigating all this expansion tectonics, and there's very much a similar sort of push and pull there too, where you have geologists that are firmly educated by the academy, and they're like, "This is how it's happened," and then you have the people who are like, "The academy is complete bullshit. None of this has ever happened. You guys are all liars. You've lied about everything," and then they're the ones that can actually point to all of the issues. That the acad the the academician has to be like yes those are issues but they don't mean what you think they mean, right. and so it's like okay maybe but the 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 act of pointing out the issues like you said is really valuable. Yeah, that's what really pushes the limits of science, makes major you know contributions to science. And so, what are the issues with the current understanding of let's say the ice ages and the pole? 
Okay. So the, the ice age, what I'll talk about here right now, I think is the number one best evidence out there for some type of catastrophism. Right. And, uh, everybody just sat up <laughs> and I, I almost like want to begin by like plugging uniformitarianism, you know, so maybe give one little thing before I go into the, mo- the, the arguments for catastrophism, because I think they're amazing. They're really good. They should not be dismissed in the way that they are right now, because they're, they're better than the arguments for strict uniformitarianism. And the ice age is the evidence is, is the proof. And I'm going to show you that it, right. It's obvious that the ice age was a different pool. And if you, you're like a reformed uniformitarianist, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like a reformed both, I guess, you know, reformed creationist and reformed uniformitarianist. And, and there's actually a name like actualism, which is hmm. like for like people who kind of sit in the middle and be like, well, you know, those strict uniformitarianists, they're like, <laughs> they're a little too much. Like there's never been a meteor impact. And then there's a creationist who like, it all happened in the flood. And it's like, well, let's get together in the middle and understand that there has been major catastrophes like meteorite impacts that might've even caused true polar wandering events, you know, but then it, it didn't happen in 7,000 years. Most likely it's very unlikely. Um, very, very unlikely. Okay. So my argument first, my number one argument, I just want to hurry and go over for uniformitarianism. Okay. The thing that for me, there's, there's almost a way around for a creationist paradigm, they can almost think of some kind of catastrophe to explain almost everything, even though they're not super logically, not super logic. You can't explain this in my mind. And that has to do with the rivers going through mountains. Okay. So if you have a river going through a huge fold, the Colorado river going through the Kaibab up fort in the Grand Canyon is a great example. The Colorado river going yeah. through the San Rafael swell, the monument up fort. There's, there's all of these, the Uncompagre up, up, there's all these folds, you know, in the Colorado river system that the river's just going straight through. Okay. Now, if you had any kind of catastrophe, let's say a meteorite hits the earth and it shakes the earth, it moves the, the plates, or it's, sorry, it moves the pole. Well, you've got a massive amount of angular momentum in the earth. If you have any kind of shift in the pole, it's going to probably cause plate movement, right? It's actually going to be a driving mechanism for plate tectonics. So mainstream science has completely um, poo-pooed that idea. It's like, no, no, all plate movement is happening strictly from plate tectonics, from convection cells within the mantle. It's not happening from changes in angular momentum, like Hapgood and Einstein's forward might have suggested. I'd say, okay, yes, there's evidence that that's right. Because if you had massive movements, these folds would, would uplift and would cause lakes to form behind them. Right. If suddenly a, a, a river is going through a, a fold, the fold uplates, even, even if it's like 50 feet, right? The fold makes 50 feet of uplift, right? It's it, just makes, it makes a dam. It makes a dam, exactly. And then it's going to make a lake behind that dam, and that lake is going to leave sediment that you're going to see in the geologic record. Okay. We even don't. if the river comes back eventually, like you still should be able to see the fact that there was something there that changed as opposed to it just looking like it has always for its entire history just been a river. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you had a fold uplift like, let's say, 300 feet. And now you have a 300 foot reservoir behind that that's so massive. It's such huge surface area that it's evaporating essentially before it even overtops the thing. You're, you're going to create a ton of sediment and you're going to see that sediment. Right. And we know that because there are examples of it, like in the middle of the Grand Canyon, there is like lava flows that went down to the Grand Canyon, created dams, filled up the Grand Canyon, left a lot of sediment. It's still being eroded away today, you know, some million years later. We just don't see very much of that on the Colorado Plateau. That should be evidence that these uplifts are happening so slowly that the river is able to keep up with the uplift. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The river is eroding away at the same rate as the thing uplifts. It's not happening overnight with a meteor impact. It's like the same thing in the Pacific Northwest because you have the Columbia, the Columbia drains through the Cascades. The Cascades are younger than the river. As far as I remember the story. They're they're older than the river. They're older than the river? Well, okay, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. The fact that the river goes through them, right, then the river predates the Cascades. I think, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that that's the case. And so basically like, because the, each volcano doesn't live for very long. And so I I, I think that the river has drained perhaps a smaller basin, but as the uplift has happened, it's basically just like worked its way through, through the rocks exactly the same way as in the Colorado. 
I think you get at like a larger point here too. I actually have a really old friend who's a hardcore creationist, and I talked to him. I was actually just talking to him about this this morning. Like in the You're greater amped for the conversation, the greater yeah, exactly, a greater <laughs> cosmological context. And I think it really comes down to mechanism for me, right? It's like uh, I just I just need to understand how X, Y, or Z was possible, and and it's it's tricky when you're talking to somebody who has the position that there was just some sort of magic. Like, I'm not going to explain to you how this, that, or the other thing happened. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, the only thing we have in science is explanation and mechanism. All we can possibly do is suggest what may have happened by introducing a mechanism for it. And then we can all understand it. Like, you might not like it, but at least you can understand it. And uh, I think this is, like, fundamentally the issue for me with these creationist arguments. Is like, they're not giving me a mechanism. I'm like, I'm totally open to believe any or at least consider any wild possibility that you put in front of me but i need to at least understand how it could be so uh, yeah and if only i could open up even google earth you know and and just it's like all my visualizations you gotta you gotta see it it's hard to, without like walking out in the app crap like if i could show you the san rafael swell or the monument up uplift and you could see that these layers are all like they were flat layers and now they're bent and they're bent up in some cases, you know, five to 10,000 feet, like the UNO arch. They're, they're flat layers. We know we're flat and now they're up like this. Well, obviously how did that happen? They went up. The only question is how fast did they go up? Can you tell the difference between whether they went up or whether everything else went down? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Because they were deposited at sea level. So within that huge package of sediment, we're going to, we have, beach environments right that are completely formed at sea level and but so like if the sur surroundings around them went down wouldn't it look the same well if so if the surroundings went down then that layer would be below sea level right now correct no i think that he's he's imagining that there's like a peak that's particularly like let's say that there's some kind of feature under like it's underplated by some some kind of hard rock there and everything else is able to subside and so that that one environment stays at elevation, and then everything else around it goes down. So it's basically like an island that uh, that remains. Yeah, but the same the same point. This is a man. I just wish I could take you guys. You know, anybody. This is what I need to take my videos, and I just need to like walk the actual outcrop because once you see it, then you're like, oh, wow, that's a tidal flat. Like that layer that we're walking on the Moen Kopi, and that layer is a tidal flat environment. And I see it. I see the the gypsum and the evaporates that. Like that thing is perfectly flat and was formed at sea level, but now it's 5,000 feet above sea level. And in another location, it's 10,000 feet above sea level. And mm. I can like see it going from 5,000 feet to 10,000 feet and then back down to 5,000 feet. How did it get from sea level to 5,000 feet to 10,000 feet? Are you suggesting 10,000 suggesting... feet of subsistence? Yeah, I guess I'm suggesting maybe the sea is lower than... Than then 10,000 feet lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my same point, if, if it subsided, it would be below sea level. About like the sea, I guess I'm assuming the sea is, is also subsiding at the same rate. Yeah. So, like if the ocean subsides, right? So it's like the, the like, because the oceanic crust is distinct. More water from, in the past? I don't know. Oh, yeah. More water. In the, but then you'd see like continuous recession of that marine layer over the entire landscape, right? So you should be able to trace it back. Like if, if let's say that the sea was at 10,000 feet and then it came down to 5,000 feet. So you have beaches at both 10,000 feet and 5,000 feet. For it to get to zero feet, you would then have to be able to trace it across the landscape I got you, yeah. and show that it recedes somehow. And maybe you can. I don't know. Can you? Yeah. In the Colorado Plateau, you can do it better than anywhere else on Earth. You can trace it for hundreds of miles. The exact and so same do way. you end up just getting to the beach? Like current beach? Um, with some of the layers, yep. With most of the layers, things start to change as you get into California and Arizona. And so the question is, did like was there a pushing up or was there a falling down, right? I think that that's what you're getting at. Yeah, I don't know enough about this. I, I'm just thinking out loud. I, I, I'd, I'd have to go look at it like you said. Exactly. We'd, we'd take you there and you'd see exactly <laughs> what we're talking about. And the most, for the most part, you know, we're going to talk always relative to sea level. And whether sea level was changing or not, is kind of immaterial. If it's 5,000 feet above current sea level, 
the land rose, right? Oh, but if you could say that like everything else subsided except for that area, it's no, I mean, what is it? <laughs> it's the same diff, you know what I mean? It yeah, is the like same the, diff, the land yeah. still rose, yeah. It is the same diff. Like relative to sea level, the land has <laughs> risen. It's just like, yeah. Think... yeah. Relativity. <laughs> well, what we want to talk about specifically though is like, where things are folding and why they're folding, you know, why you've got mountain chains forming in one area. And, and well, the, the, challenge, the, hold on, this was all brought up in context of uniformitarianism, and it still doesn't challenge the idea of uniformitarianism. Well, hold right? on, I, I wasn't just trying to be pesky. I was, <laughs> I'm always searching to understand if the earth is getting smaller or larger and what the dynamics of those are. That That's all. So there's a theory that uh, uh, Jeffrey Wilinski is kind of the champion of, which is called stellar metamorphosis. And he has a really interesting arc of how stars evolve into rocky planets and how rocky planets then evolve into rocky moons and sm progressively smaller bodies. And so if there was evidence that the Earth was shrinking, then that would be support to the idea that the Earth will, over time, collapse in on itself in such a way that it would make something that looks more like our moon than something that looks like the planet right now. It's it's very it's it was very a popular like, Russian theory too. I mean, it was first popularized by Aparin in the Soviet Union, and uh, there's a, a graduate student at NYU named Anthony Abruzzo who wrote a bunch of papers about this too, and it's kind of entertaining. But the timelines are obviously extraordinary compared to the ones that most people have settled on at the moment. Um, you know, these processes would obviously take billions, if not trillions, of years, um, which is older than what we're told the age of the universe is. So. I, I don't. Uh, I think when later on, maybe we want to get into like expanding Earth hypothesis. I I actually think um, that gets a bad rap, and there's there's evidence that it could be a possibility, and most people won't even consider that evidence. But hopefully, we'll get into that later. Um, I mean, the continents fit together like like puzzle pieces. If you if you roll with the expansion model, which is kind of well, stunning. I never even thought about it before until this year. I don't know why the continents necessarily have to fit together. They don't have like to. It's just pieces. stunning, you know. It is stunning. It's just stunning. But I mean, they fit together like puzzle pieces under the traditional model. Uh, so, there's a big so. there's a big ocean that opens. And so like the people who advocate for expansion tectonics are basically like, well, the Tethys is uh it's an artifact of an improper shape an improper size of the globe that they're modeling it on because there's no indication that there was a deep ocean f between i think that it's like india and uh Euro europe i think uh, or south america let's, let's save it let's, let's save, save it, it until okay. we get uh to the mechanistic stage <laughs> yeah. of this I've been presentation reading a lot about this and so i'm chomping at the bit but no um <laughs> i think that what we've gotten to is the fact that there is ample evidence for uniformitarianism because you look at the landscape and there are distinct features where you're like, this could not have happened overnight, so to right. speak. Right. And I did look, and the Cascade Range is older. It's like 37 million years old, but the mountains around the path of the Columbia are only 2 million years old, but the Columbia is 12 million years old. So uh, that's, that's actually a lot more complicated than that. Let's, let's get into that. And that's different <laughs> yeah. than the Colorado Plateau, too, because when we're talking about the Cascades, we've got two different parts that we're talking about. We're talking about the, the mountain, the, the volcanic aspect of them versus the actual folding, the tectonic, mm -hmm. like marginal mm -hmm. um, tectonic folding of the Cascades. Let's go, let's get, let's go somewhere else with that though. Just okay. uh, let me, let me get through this really quick. Take us. Okay. Because, so I left with the fact that, that these folds are going so slow that the rivers are able to keep up with them, even tiny rivers. Not only that, even places where the river only flows two or three times a year. <clears throat> Right, so I could take you to like the Coxcomb, um, or or places in in the San Rafael Swell, where you've essentially got dry washes going through this up this fold, this thing that's slowly going up, and yet this dry wash is able to keep up with the uplift. Right, it doesn't even have a perennial like a, a river that's going through it all the time. It's just when it floods, and yet it's able to keep up and dig a canyon as the rest of the of the fold goes up. Okay, so we know that it's happening slowly and there's not a lot of evidence for quick uplift, except where there is. And that's an important point too. It's, there are examples of where rivers rerouted, right? So the Uncompagre uplift on the border of Utah and, um, and Colorado is a great example. The Colorado River used to, it, it 
carved a canyon through the Uncombagre uplift. And then something happened that made the river, the Colorado, completely abandon its course through this canyon and then go around the uplift, which is exactly what we would expect to see over and over if a catastrophe made a quick jolt, right? It would create a dam. That dam would fill the basin. It would find a route away, a, a, a way around the fold and then create a new course. So we see that, right? So then here we, even though in where 90% of the situations the rivers are keeping up with the uplift. So it's evidence of uniformitarianism. In a few select examples, they do found way, find ways around, which suggests there have been catastrophic events where that fold uplifted so much that it created a dam and let the river reroute its way around. Okay, that, and that's an important distinction. And, and once you can really visualize and understand where those exist and how they exist, then suddenly you kind of get a feel for how much a uniformitarianism is true, but how much for an argument of catastrophic events there is. And so what's the fraction? What's, what's the, is it like 50-50? <clears throat> is it like mostly no, uniformitarian? No, it's it's and like it's... 90, 90 to 97% uniformitarianist. And then just these little small examples of like, wow, okay, there was a catastrophic event here. There was some kind of a major well, if ca- catastrophes were common, you know, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. It's, it's, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's, and do you think that they are related to, are they temporally related to the same catastrophic event? Or do you, do you think that it's possible to, to trace back what catastrophic events happened? Or is there, is there a window that kind of closes erosionally, so to speak, where, or depositionally or whatever, where when you go far enough back into history, you stop being able to identify the catastrophic places? Yeah, it gets harder and harder for sure the further back you get. But I think that the best lines of evidence, if we're going to try and find some kind of a periodicity for catastrophe, is going to be, first of all, extinction events. Is there a periodicity in the fossil record of when major extinction events happen? And then second is the Ice Age that we're going to get to in a second. That's a huge one. If the Ice Age is coming and going and coming and going, what's causing that? Right. The predominant model right now is Milankovitch cycles. I think that it is a sucky model. It's a horrible model. Mm. And I think it was politics that basically got everyone convinced that the Milankovitch cycles were... Can you explain that really quickly? The Milankovitch cycle? So the Milankovitch cycles, right? You've got these three astronomical um, phenomena that have the possibility of making Earth colder. So one, right, is the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit when we're further away from the sun right? It's not perfectly circular. It's going kind of like a comet a little bit. So when we're further away from the sun, we're colder. Okay. Two would be um, uh, precession, right? So like when the, the earth's, we're at 23, what, 24 degrees as far as our axial tilt, but that's not constant. It kind of moves a little bit, right? But if you get a more, um, if you get a higher tilt, in our, um, our axis, then it's gonna be colder when you're away from the earth, but then actually warmer when you're there's facing toward the earth, or the sun, sorry, I have to get through my <clears throat> missteps here. So anyway, so hopefully you get that, that idea there. Okay. They sort of sum up to this extra cold moment basically, and then yeah. everything freezes over, except yeah. it doesn't freeze over everywhere. <laughs> right, right. And I guess that's obliquity, like, and then precession is pretty much the same thing because not only is it kind of going like this, it's actually kind of going like a top, it's wobbling. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the big point being Milinkovic made this argument that it's like, well, since the number one thing that's going to determine an ice age actually tends to be like the axial tilt, but on an exactly perfect circle, since it makes the summers warmer and the winter's colder, they cancel each other out. So there's no net effect, except for if you combine it with eccentricity, because what if it faces away from it? So it's being cold when we're further away from the sun, but then when we come over here, we're closer to the sun. Now they don't cancel each other out. And so we can do some mathematics to try and see where these three, but it's mainly the two that play the biggest part, where these, these two astronomical events kind of like reinforce each other and when they cancel each other out to cause an ice age. And it seems like there wasn't another, there wasn't really another mechanism that was on the table necessarily. 
Yeah, probably. I think they could have come. Does up the Milankovitch cycle address why it started all of a sudden? Because my understanding is that this interglacial glacial cycle has only been going on for a little yeah. while. Yeah, somewhere between. Yeah, I mean the, the Pleistocene essentially, f- maybe five to when Antarctica started being glaciated somewhere around maybe thirty million years ago. But so, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so it do- I don't think it does. It doesn't okay. really give a good. But oh, hold on, I have a, I have a que- I have a question about that. You you said that the glaciations began five hundred thousand years ago. Antarctica has evidence of glaciation going back, um, if I'm not mistaken, to like the Oligocene, which is like you know in the twenty to thirty million year time period ago, right? Whereas the northern ice sheets, um, whether it be Greenland or the now extinct you know Laurentian or um, Scandian ice sheets, they they're not as old. There there isn't evidence that for they are going more than um, like fifteen million years ago, and, and even that I've read so many different. Every paper says something different. And this is something that Shailen and I were kind of talking about, which is: is there a relationship to the deeper glacial periods? Because there's some that go all the way. You know, like this if you... is like some terribly confusing terminology because each one of these huge glacial periods, I think, is called an ice age, but they each have sub glacial interglacial moments too which is what the milankovitch i think is addressing like each one of these have 10 maybe 10 different right because sorry we're looking at a chart we're here. looking at a chart of uh, phanerozoic climate change and so you can see that there's the recent one that started about 50, 000, 50 million years ago to the present and then there's ones that are deeper in the past which i think are what people are talking about you you have to go all the way to i think 500 million years ago and you get to like snowball earth stuff and yeah <clears throat> yeah and the evidence for those is so radically different we're just going to talk about place to see okay glaciation right now very and recent get stuff. into permian stuff where we're finding glacial evidence in africa or other phanerozoic thing, things that go back to cambrian there's, that's gonna be your second hit yeah we'll deal with well, the first and, that, and that, that stuff's just so debatable it's like yeah the evidence is just completely different so let's not talk about anything older than like the 10 million years ago for now, <clears throat> because <clears throat> the mechanisms were undoubtedly different back then anyway. Okay. And I, I think that that's totally reasonable because it's like the geology requires you to be able to look at the surface and be able to tell what happened. There's almost not, there's not stuff that's on the surface from 500 million years ago, really. Well, there is. And that's... The cratons? But, but it's set... Anyway, they find basically a deposit that looks like a moraine, you know? Mm, mm-hmm. So you find these um, big layers. It's like, well, this looks like a terminal moraine from a giant mm. ice sheet, you know, or maybe we see scouring that it looks mm. like an ice sheet kind of went over this. But it's so scarce and scattered that it's difficult to nail down its exact limits, whether yeah. it, it really is what you're seeing. And then we have to combine it with how different the atmosphere was during those times. And, the, sure. and that's usually what we try and... It's like, well, the, the, the whole snowball ice house, hot house is mostly atmospheric. Anyway, so listen, anyway. I, and I, I think that's, I, I didn't mean to, I, I think I may have entered into that as if there was something wrong with that. But I think that it's it's totally reasonable and wise to focus on a narrower chunk than trying to explain like all of geology all at once. Right, right. Yeah, so, and you know, it probably should have just started with the fact that so the ice sheets, right, that, that they're not symmetrical. So then this is kind of like the whole point of this entire podcast, I'd hope, is just show this one picture, essentially, like this one model that I've made where it shows people that the ice sheets went all the way down to Chicago, to New York, you know, that the Great Lakes were the periphery. And I'm talking about all the Great Lakes, all the way from St. Lawrence Seaway up to the Great Slave and Bear Lakes in Canada, that was the periphery of the Laurentian ice sheet, right? Um, and what's so, really bizarre is that it wasn't on the other side. Yeah, exactly. So then in Europe, you know, it goes down into England, it goes through Scandinavia, but it does not exist in Siberia, and it does not exist in northern Alaska. And this and, was part of Hapgood's argument, from what I understand, too, is that there was these really fertile nice green areas of siberia at that time there was some evidence for that um exactly and if people really understand what a proglacial lake is how it's formed and how they um, relate to the periphery like 
finding the exact end um, terminal moraine, basically, for the main advances of those ice sheets, like then it all comes alive. Like once you see that and you understand it, you can start exploring it on Google Earth yourself. And you can be like, oh, yeah. Okay, like once I know the difference between something that's been completely scoured by a, a continental ice sheet versus maybe like a, a, a karstic, what they call thermokarst terrain, then you can explore it yourself and you can be like, oh, yeah, well, I can, I can see exactly in Siberia where there were ice sheets and it was only in the mountains. And can, thermokarst terrain is areas where it looks like there's these lakes that are left by glacial deposition, but in reality, it's the thawing of permafrost in the tundra and so you get these kind of like kettle lakes almost exactly exactly and if you go to north alaska first of all when you look at the mountains the mountains have a lot of regolith on them <clears throat> they're not highly glaciated right not like the the mountains in like let's say scandinavia or um greenland or anything are like it's pretty obvious even in the mountains that these weren't very highly glaciated but in the valleys right where you have an where you have a continental ice sheet it completely destroys the, the regolith. It just completely denudes the topography and scours everything to bedrock. And not only does it go to bedrock, it, it creates just lake after lake after lake because it's not even even. So then it, it's super obvious. You want to go look at the tundra in northeast Canada. It's obvious where the ice sheet was. There's no, there's no debate among glaciologists where the ice sheet was. Mm. Unfortunately, there is a lot of like armchair geologists and people who don't know what the hell they're talking about who end up drawing like pictures of where the ice sheet was and they have it coming down into Siberia or they have it covering all of Alaska, right? Or they have it even coming down into Washington and Oregon, which is complete. I don't know. Can we swear on here? Mm. <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> you, had, you had mountain glaciers. Like there was absolutely massive mountain glaciers coming out of all the Rockies and the Cascades. But that's a, there's a big difference between a continental glacier and a mountain glacier. So if you try and draw the ice sheet and you have it going all the way from New York straight across through like South Dakota and into like Idaho and then across into like Oregon, that's bull crap. That's not what the ice sheet looked like, right? It, it curved up into Alberta. And basically, even though there might have been ice that closed the corridor between the mountain glaciers of the Rockies and the continental glacier, like they probably ran together. Um, and so maybe you had like 50 feet or a hundred feet of snow in there and you didn't have a continental glacier in there. The continental glacier's main periphery was scouring out those proglacial lakes. And that becomes even more obvious in Europe because you have the Baltic sea going up into them. You have the white sea coming down. Like it's really obvious where those glaciers came and they did not match um, the latitude at all. Right, they're completely off skelter. They're they're centered on Greenland in a way that when you look at it in three D, it's so obvious that the only pro, like plausible answer is that there was a, a different North Pole during the Ice Age. And so, why? Is well, let's the... say that one more time, just just in case anybody okay. missed that. Go for it. The only plausible explanation is that there was a different North Pole during the Ice Ages. And let me let me give you some of the like the explanations the glaciologists come up with, and they're all ridiculous. They're dumb, right? The, the, the only reason why we even have them is because we know what was, and so we have to come up with stupid explanations to try to explain it, right? And so the, the number one explanation is that, well, so Siberia, all the way from like 10 to 30 degrees south, it was just too cold to snow, right? And so that the, the Hadley cells are such that we couldn't get storms into Siberia. And so there was no snow falling in Siberia. And that's why it was never really glaciated. That's why ice came down to New York and Berlin, 10,000 feet of it. And yet we couldn't even have 200 feet of it in Siberia. And this is the Arctic desert argument. Yeah, the Arctic desert argument. Which but is, you, and you make the point in your blog that like, good luck trying to apply that to Antarctica or something like that. Exactly. Yep, and that's my that's my main reason why it's stupid. It's a it's a bad explanation, right? So first of all, the center of Antarctica has the exact same conditions. There's very very little snow that falls in the center of Antarctica because those storms come into there and they hit you know, the warm air that carries the moisture hits the cold air of the ice sheets and it just drops all this moisture and so hardly any makes it into the center. But there's still ten thousand feet of ice in the center of Antarctica, 
right? Because it doesn't matter. Even if you only have an inch of snow a year, if you've got basically zero melting, you're still going to accumulate a kind of glacier, right? And you had the same thing going on in the tundra of Canada. Like you had a huge central area of the t- in the center of, uh, of Canada that accumulated 10,000 feet of ice, even though all the storms were undoubtedly dropping all their moisture on the periphery, but they still managed to make their way into the center and accumulated 10,000 feet of ice. So, so to try to use any kind of like a uh, glacial desert, you know, or, or ice age desert in Siberia for why it never got glaciated. It's just a dumb explanation. And I, I'm sure there's some people who like have fooled themselves into thinking that it's a great explanation, but I want, I would, I want to sit down with them, you know, and, and, uh, and treat them respectfully, but really like, let's think about this rationally. Yeah. Maybe we can organize that at some point. Um, I remember the first time when Shiloh told me that the ice ages weren't what I had seen in, in textbook pictures. He was like reading about this and he was like, you know that the ice ages weren't like they weren't over the poles, right? And I was like, there's no way. Shut up. I was like, you're wrong. (laughs) You're absolutely wrong. There's no way. I was like, I've seen the pictures. And then he started showing me all this stuff and I was like, oh my God, the pictures are wrong. Is this just driven by an extreme desire to not entertain catastrophism? Yeah, it's a hard one. I, I think that definitely plays into it. And and I I get that. Like when I was in school, like there was they they really create a stigma against like like they make fun of and, and maybe they should, you know, because a lot of creationists have are just not good scientists, you know, they they come up with such harebrained ideas. And so you definitely do create a have a bias, you know, against creationism, but also against any kind of idea of catastrophism. Uh, don't you think it's like maybe also rooted in this need for the state's knowledge base to be a a great protector and and to be able to reassure the pu- the public that you know everything's cool that like the planet's basically going to be the same tomorrow as it was yesterday don't worry and like we talked to the director of the GSIS at NASA GISS Goddard Institute of Space Science GISS um and we were like, hey, why, what if we have another ice age? And, what, he, was, and what, he was like, we're never going to have another one of those. We're done with ice ages. Well, why would anyone say that? He wasn't even willing to talk about it. He's he was just like. absolutely <laughs> dead center. And this is the guy who sits at the, he, he's literally the lead of the NASA program. Don't say that word on this show. <laughs> the, the word that which shall not be mentioned on YouTube. <laughs> But the it's, program. it just it's a few others. It blew my mind because it was just this absolute dismissal. He's like, "No, those aren't going to happen again." And it's really deep this desire to so this uniformitarian desire. I think is viewed as being necessary for people's psychological well being. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a lot more complicated than that. Because the alternative, which is creationism, um, is typically not great, you know. And so, and so now we have an ideological debate, which is no different than a political debate. I mean, mm-hmm. But evidence is evidence, right? So you, but, you, you know, the we- bipolar nature of these debates is just mind-boggling to me. Like our inability to entertain multipolar arguments in a scientific conversation is just absolutely perplexing. I, I, I just have always. It's the one thing that drove me actually away from just participating in academic science because I'm like, yo, there's actually a lot of possibilities for most of these things. And we probably shouldn't just move on from one and call it a done deal and just forget about it ever, really. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't help science to like completely dismiss kind of the fringes, but at the same time, it's hard not to dismiss the fringes when, when they're, some of their arguments are so poor. You know, then it's like, uh, anyway, that, that it's a difficult, that's really a hard, just, it's just hard even for me to try and like reconcile the political nature of science because there's good arguments on both sides on why there should be gatekeepers to science and why there shouldn't be gatekeepers to science and why we should poo-poo some ideas and why we shouldn't poo-poo some ideas. 
I mean, I think making information easily available, making science papers readable, making it so that somebody off the street who has an interest in geology can actually get up to speed on the methods that people use and have resources like yours where it's a road guide and you can basically go to utahgeology.com and like figure out some place that you're going to go and then look at it. And that's fundamentally the the kind of access that you want to give people. You want to have open transparent discussions right people need to be able to make sense of things on their own and teach them the standards of like what responsible theorizing looks like right because it's not it, from the outside i think that scientific theories look basically like people are just making stuff up you're not a scientist you have no idea what goes on in the academy you've never read the preliminary literature you've never been trained in the method and you're just like they're just saying stuff well if they get to say stuff i'm gonna say stuff right. and then all of a sudden you have the people in the academy being like well you can't say stuff like that and so then you have this explosion of just like well you don't get to tell me what i get to say and then it just it it, it rifts and rifts and rifts and rifts i want to get back to what you started to tell us which was the three the the, the like conventional arguments against a pole shift and you because we got to this arctic desert yeah and really but there that, are others that, that's really the main one so uh, so as far okay so as far as like um why they think that there's no ice in siberia the arctic desert and very similar weather phenomenon that's their only argument okay it seems like the lack of mechanism thing, we, I, I do want to deal with mechanisms later, but it seems like that's a huge one too, is just people being like, well, there's no event that could possibly pull that off or something like that. Okay, so yeah, so there's there's probably the, the huge nail on the head. In order to have any kind of an idea that the pull shifted rapidly, okay, we have to solve a couple of problems that no one's been able to solve and they're huge problems, right? So f- one of them is the periodicity, like that we see that the ice ages came and went, came and went, came and went. And we have pretty good records for at least the last, you know, five of them or so, and less good records that maybe go back for another 15 or something. But we, but what on earth? So if you've got, if you're going to try and suggest that the actual pull was switching, right, instead of just uh, ice, says that just the whole earth getting colder and warmer, now we have to have a mechanism for what would cause the pull to shift. Right. Uh, that what would cause it to shift fast enough to cause the changes in temperature that we see, but slow enough to not rip the earth apart, <laughs> slow enough to not be having creating massive catastrophic events like what I said before that would that would cause mountain chains to raise and stop rivers and and create lakes in the Colorado River system that they'd have to reroute their way around that we don't see hardly any of. Okay, so then that's difficult. Like that's really hard, even for me to try and like come up with a theory that I feel is solid enough to present to the scientific community and say, hey, I think this is rational. Like that's that's a hard ask. No one's been able to do it. And even so my theory that I'll start to cover here, which is the best one that I think I've come up with, we still need to try and figure out like, well, what, how is it happening slow enough to not be creating mountain chains? Or maybe is it creating mountain chains, but but it's still like, maybe we don't understand the way that crestal displacement would actually happen because maybe there is a kind of a huge impact, but then it's actually happens slow because there's an elasticity. Like a decompression, decompressive sort of yeah. event. Yeah, but what would make it come and go? You know, that's the big one. Like, why, why would it go like from the normal North Pole to the Greenland North Pole, the normal North Pole to the Greenland North Pole? That's a hard one, yeah. Well, that that to me seems like a resonant. It's like a, if, if it's an if it's a glancing impact of some kind, this right? It's so regular. What would make it go back to the exact same old one? Oh, well, because the mass, it's like a, uh, it's like one of those like weeble wobbles, you know, okay. like the... Yeah, that's, that's what I think. Okay. Right. So I think <laughs> the weeble wobble <laughs> mechanism, clear <laughs> as mud. Okay. Thank you, guys. The frame, that's what we're going to call it. No, okay, so I think that the only good explanation that you could have is that there's some kind of dipole in the mass distribution of the Earth, right? So that right now we've got the equatorial bulge, right? Because the Earth is a little bit fatter at the equator than it is at the poles. And so that creates a mass imbalance so that the Earth is basically like a top, right? And so it kind of keeps it, it at its current North Pole. You'd have to have a, quite a jolt to get it off of it, to, to be able to break the um, the gravitational um, I mean, what do you even call this centripetal force that's created by the equatorial bulge to keep it in its present present course, 
So first of all, we have to just inertia. Yeah, we have to have something that's pretty big to break that. But then we have to have something that makes it go to a second one and then back. And I think it's like, well, what if you have a top that is has two different centers of mass, right? And they're almost equal, but they kind of go on different planes. And that's my theory. And and I've seen gravity work, and we can kind of show like an image here, maybe that I'll send you or something in the mantle of these massive. Um, basically density imbalances within the earth that mostly are caused from ancient, you know, basalt uh, plumes, you know, they're basically mantle plumes, but they create this, this imbalance so that there are two poles. So then if you imagine like spinning a top and instead of it having one pole, it has two poles. And so it just kind of switches back and forth between these two poles. And there's some, some, imagery of uh of them doing it in space actually like spinning tops and having them switch back and forth between the tops oh yeah there's that like the little key that like when you start flipping the yeah, the key will it, spin and, and then, then it flips yeah have you seen this yeah derek did a video uh, about the tennis racket problem that's kind of a similar idea yeah. as well yeah i think by st- in that. yeah mm-hmm. that's a good one um by stability is a really surprising natural phenomenon that you start to see everywhere once once you uh, begin to adapt your your vision to that. Well, I mean, we use it in engineering all the time too. Um, I have multiple so questions. Okay, let me let me go a little bit further. Okay. Real quick. So then that that's a good uh, mechanism for why it would switch between two different poles. We still have problems to solve. So the second one is why would it be on a certain periodicity? Why would it be that every like eleven thousand years it switches between the two? If it's just random meteor strikes, well, then it should be random. Like it's randomly switching between the two. Why is it on a periodicity? How okay. good's the periodicity? It's pretty good. good. Yeah. Like how, like, is it really like that, the same interval between each glaciation, the same extent of glaciation? It's, it's pretty good. And we can talk about though, like how, how good can you suggest that the radiocarbon dating that it's based on is? Because once you get back before, I mean, even when you get before 10,000 BC, there's a very small amount of radiocarbon left in the things that you're dating. And once we get to 40,000 BC, that's like, there's almost zero radiocarbon left. And so we're using, like, there's some question in, as to the, the resolution um, of, of our readings, you know, because they're mostly radiocarbon dated. But it makes sense to me, like, just to give, like, Gavin a tiny bit of credit, like, that there would be feedback loops, right? As you start to get glaciers building in new places and melting in other places, you can, uh, you can accelerate these processes just because you, your, your different gases are getting tied up in those glaciers and plant matter is getting consumed. And, like, there is, there is a feedback loop that you would expect to occur if there was even some, you know, minor change all of a sudden. Yeah, uh, so, many, so many of those. Which could sort of drag it, right? If it, it could sort of maybe drag it in one direction or the other. Yeah. But the, 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 so you're saying that basically, like, how do you explain the fact that it's so periodic? Yeah, both so the periodic and so total. Like, the things that you're talking about now are kind of going back into like the arguments of maybe a huge introduction of fresh water into the ocean makes them collapse faster or grow faster. There's so many different environmental influences that could cause them to grow or. Anyway, those those are all weeds, <laughs> in my opinion, because they're small differences compared to the big difference that we should be focusing on. Okay, so I'll I'll just dive right into my theory of how the periodicity could work. Okay, and this one is one that I would love to like talk to an astrophysicist about um, uh, because it's out there. So my geology stuff that's my specialty, my expertise. I'll debate anybody about that kind of stuff, right? And feel confident that I'm going to win. But in this stuff, somebody could like could, could school me, and I'd appreciate. It. Can I ask you one quick question before you lay the astrophysics theory out? I, just just to make sure I understand uh, the phenomenology of what you're ex- about to explain. Did the did Antarctica shift also? Antarctica that. There's not there's not great data on Antarctica shifting. There is still data of like the same periodicity of oxygen isotope, right? And the oxygen isotope curves that they have are based on the amount of fresh water versus salt water in the ocean or even in 
you know, in the ice, which is a proxy for what's going on in the ocean. But yeah, it's showing that temperature is going up and down in Antarctica too. Um, if, if what I'm saying is right, you know, as far as this back and forth, we should be able to get better data on different parts of Antarctica. Right, parts right. Of Antarctica should be deglaciating while other parts of Antarctica are actually going into a deeper deglaciation. Uh, look look find... forward to demystify sci and Utah geology field trip to Antarctica. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> 2025. Expedition. Right? <laughs> yeah. And then even funner, we'll have to visit New Zealand, Southern New Zealand, and uh, Southern Argentina and Chile. You know, It'll be a really hard trip. It'll be a really <laughs> a true suffer fest. Yeah. So the, I, in my in my beliefs, I think that a lot of the, the glaciology that's been done in those southernmost parts of the world are are based on such like a strong paradigm of of the entire world glaciating that they haven't looked hard enough for the resolution that we should should see, which is that some of these areas are getting warmer while the north parts are getting colder. Man, and that's also, oh. sorry. That seems like uh, that's that's a that's an amazing like low hanging exped- fruit. Yeah, right? that's a good e- expedition. It's like that's some <laughs> publishable stuff right away. There's not a ton of land down there though, right? Because I was looking at the maps that you have on the blog, and so it's like when the pole shifts and it moves onto Greenland, you it shifts onto the land. Maybe but like the, pole, the tips of uh, the yeah, tips you get of South just America. like the very very southern tips of continents. Yeah, and I think like what is it like? I mean, you can look. So if you have the pole shifting to Greenland, then the pole should go off the center of Antarctica and actually move toward Australia. So then that means when things are glaciating in the Northern hemisphere, when you're getting more glaciation in, you know, the Americas and Europe, an ice age, essentially, we should actually be getting more glaciation in Tanzania, right? And Southern New Zealand, but we should be getting less glaciation in Argentina and Chile. And we should also see a difference in Antarctica. Like one part of it should be picking up ice while the other part loses ice. But like I say, I have, I've, I've read, a, there's a lot of really good stuff in Patagonia. There's not a lot of good stuff. Um, and, and maybe that's debatable. Anyway, like I say, I think that there needs to be stronger resolution to actually look for that problem. And then once you look for it, I think that it would be found. That, that okay. would be a fun book to write. You might think about it. So as far okay. as the mechanism though, this is my, Let's do it. Um, this is my idea. Okay. So I think there has to be something that's that's got a very strong periodicity. So then what? why would we get hit by comets or something like that? You know, something that could actually tilt the earth exactly every, you know, 11, you know, 20,000 years or whatever on this periodic schedule. The only thing that I could think is there's got to be something about the nature of the galaxy itself. So that as we're traveling through it, we're passing these things that happen on that schedule. Okay. And so what kind of, um, and, and this is another thing I need to show an illustration. Um, okay. So I believe that there are these waves emanating out, basically gravity waves emanating out from the galactic core, right? So our galactic core not completely sure what it is, but lately it's it seems most likely there's like two big black holes in there, right? Sagittarius A. It's just like something that's really heavy that's moving things. Right. And everything is connected to the thing that's at the center. And so as it moves, it's going to wobble the stuff that's farther away. Yeah, exactly. You know, and they're rotating around each other and that's what's giving the uh, our galaxy the, the shape that it has. Okay, but I saw this illustration once. It just like blew my mind. I thought, oh my gosh, that's so crazy. That's it. And what it was, um, you can see it on my site, I have like, there's a a gif of somebody bobbing two balls in a lake. Okay, I mean, you can picture one ball creates concentric circles that radiate out from it, if you can picture that. Okay, now picture two balls next to each other. And so the two concentric circles create a double interference pattern. Where that double interference pattern is, these two radiating concentric circles where they reinforce each other they create a wave twice as high but where they cancel out each other they create a quiet space basically a flat space in the surface of the lake and it almost looks like spokes on a wheel when you see it so then you've got these these sunbursts almost these spokes coming out from these two um, bobbing discs now all you have to do is you have to picture those two bobbing discs rotating around each other because as soon as you do that, these spokes, like these sunbursts that are coming straight out from, from those two, they start spiraling. And it creates 
a pattern that looks exactly like the spiral nature of the Milky Way galaxy. So does that make sense now? So then, then the question is what makes, what is it that drives matter in our galaxy into the arms, right, of our galaxy? So that there's not very much matter in the interstitial area between the arms, but most of it is in the arms. I suggest that these two massive, you know, um, bodies in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, what is it, Sagittarius A and Sagittarius B, right? They're creating these quiet spaces where they're canceling waves and that the matter is driven into those. And then because they're rotating around each other, they become spiral arms. But then as our solar system, right, goes around that central core, it's actually going from arm to, you know, quiet place, reinforcing wave to canceling wave, reinforcing wave to canceling wave. And this pattern that, that radiates out basically creates all these wave fronts. And, and the wave fronts, I think, are essentially gravity waves. But I'll bet you that there's, I bet you the wave fronts are not just gravity waves. I bet they're just ultra energetic waves that have all sorts of waves embedded within it, in addition to the gravity wave. Well, it's like moving stuff around. There's basically some kind of resonance that is forcing things to move in a specific way. And it's either making them move in a way that is what's happening in the bright arms versus what's happening in the dark arms. And so what you're basic, you seem to be implying that like, as the, because the, the solar systems move, you're saying through the arms of the galaxy? I mean, we know how our, we suppose we know anyway, and it seems reasonable how our, our orbit is around the galaxy, right? And it's not as, they move from arm to arm. It's basically making a circular orbit. And in its circular orbit, it goes through arm, arms and goes through space between arms. Mm, I didn't realize that. that they, uh, I, for some reason, thought we were staying the same arm as we, as we orbit around the center. Yeah, my understanding is that we don't, that we pass oh, from That's really interesting. Arm, but and you think that it's... Of years. But, but I guess it, it takes something like uh, like a quarter billion years to go completely around the thing. Yeah. And you think like we're hopping these arms on a sort of on a, on a time scale that's commensurate with the ice ages? No, 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 no. Okay. But I think that within that basic shape of the wave, this double interference pattern, that there's wave upon wave upon wave, right? And some of them are huge, but you can go down even to the smallest level and there's still waves. Um, so it's as we go through these wave fronts that we're going, that's causing the ice ages, essentially, that when we hit these wave fronts, it actually creates a catastrophe, essentially. It's like turbulence that basically shifts the way that the earth is pointed. Like I, I'm still kind of imagining it bobbing in this like sea of all material, right? So the earth is connected to everything that's around it through inertia of some kind, right? Like so matter forces other matter to move because uh, it has influence over it. And so when you pass through an area where everything is resonating in a specific way, the earth will also have to resonate with that. And it might be that it tilts in a specific way as it resonates. And then as it passes out of that, because I, I imagine it almost like a sound weapon. Like I think that the CIA has like weird devices that can shoot sound waves at people. Um, it's the same sort of thing where it's like if you're standing in the beam of that, you're going to be shaken in a specific way. And you walk out of the beam, you're shaken in a different way. And yeah, it's like with a person who's being shaken, it's just the sound that you hear or the sound that you don't hear, but it's also present on much larger scales. And we know that there's vibrational oscillations inside of the earth and inside of the solar system and everything else. Yeah, I think that that's, that's totally possible. That It's totally possible that the rarefication and compactification of matter fields would affect the events on Earth as we pass through those places. I think we shouldn't discount the possibility that there's electromagnetic interactions that also steer the solar system and the ongoings within it as well, because, you know, we, we know there's, there's great uh, plasma fields, right? And plasma is very conductive and the whole heliosphere is sitting plugged into that circuit. And, um, you know, I don't totally understand this, but there's been some... It seems like there are any number of astrophysical... Periodic astrophysical uh, procession Because I think yeah. you're right about like the fundamental uh, like crystalline organization of space. 
of stuff in space, right? Right. Because it's like we look at it and we see a pretty galaxy and people are like, oh, fancy, nice, pretty. But we don't think about what does that mean? Like, why is there such a perfect object of that scale? And what are the things that are driving it? And, you know, gravity, but gravity doesn't totally explain everything. And so there's there's other things that have to be a part of that. And there's no, if they can shape a galaxy, why wouldn't they be able to change the Earth? That just seems like a reasonable... I, I don't have I mean, the math to prove It gets that. even more complex because now we know about these intergalactic filaments which are essentially connecting... Like, galaxies are strung out. They're like, on, they're like a string of <laughs> pearls. What? what are they taking? Well, they're, they're, <laughs> there's, there's these strings of galaxies and they're, they're connected. And uh, you know, from too. what I understand, these are ionized atoms that are conductive, which are plugging all of these galaxies together. And... Uh, yeah, the periodicity really, like when you look at a sine wave, it just makes you think of harmonic electrical activity as well. I didn't follow up on this, but in one of the papers I was reading about the origin of ocean basins, he referenced the fact that one guy had done a study of the harmonics of the Earth and was basically like, well, the Earth rings at a perfect fifth and a perfect third and like all of these other harmonics. And I was like, I need to read that. <laughs> but we know, like, we know that it rings. And if it's a, if it rings... I mean, the gravitational. There's gravitational resonance between the different planets too. You know, there's several per perfect fifths and yeah, like the orbital resonances, octaves, and all that. Yeah, so like it's so easy once we get into the astrophysics aspect of it. It's so easy to kind of get into the weeds of speculation, and it's almost like we almost need like because I can I can kind of give my theories, but it's like we need an astrophysicist who can at least kind of put the ideas into the language that is the current understanding. I mean, even because my main theory is a gravity wave, right? And I don't know if you guys have read about gravity waves. Like if I, I couldn't have even given this theory 20 years ago, because even though gravity waves have been like hypothesized by Einstein, they hadn't really been developed, but now they're all over the internet. So if you just like Google gravity wave, look at the Wikipedia article, it'll give you this huge, robust explanation of what they do. I don't even know if that explanation is true. It probably isn't. It's, they're probably far more complicated than what we understand now. But the one thing that caught my eye with gravity waves was the fact that they actually distort space time. Um, so like they give an example of like a circle, like as a gravity wave passes through a planet, it'll actually distort and become an oval. And, and that's more just a visualization because in reality, it's not just distorting the shape, it's distorting space time itself. But my understanding is that basically the shape would, like you'd find things elongating and shrinking as a gravity wave passed through it. And so um, just taking that understanding, which I understand, obviously, like I said, I don't think that it's true. I think that our understanding of gravity waves will probably be developed a lot. So this, people watch this in 20 years, they'll be like, no, nah, that's not exactly how it worked. But, but I think that there are these waves that pass through things and they really do distort shape. And so what if that, that in, in itself was enough to actually change. So if we do have this like bi-axis, you know, that was enough to kind of like change the shape of the earth as the gravity wave passed through. Um, but then there's lots of issues with that, that you'd need an astrophysicist to be like, well, how fast are these things moving? Is there like big waves and then small waves and some of the tiny waves maybe you could pass through within in like a 500 year period. And at what point would would the compression or the changing of the earth then activate the second, you know, bipole so that the earth would then shift to its other center of mass? Yeah, I mean, a lot of, I think that's something that we've, we've kind of come across recently is how useful it is to be able to parameterize something mathematically of just like, these are the forces that are necessary in order to produce the kinds of changes ballpark. This is how much, you know, how much torque you would need in order to actually be able to turn it. This is the kind of, this is, this is the amount of material that you would need to torque the earth to this degree. It's like the, the process of being able to, to really dig down to what it could be, I think does start with just the process of like, okay, well, how, how big would it have had to be? Like how, how much, how much of a push does it need? Right. And cause we were talking to, we were talking to somebody about consciousness and he, it was Donald Hoffman. We just put the episode out and he was talking about how he was working on consciousness when it was impolite to talk about it as an academic researcher. Right, right. And Shiloh asked this really interesting question, which was, well, how did you get people to listen? 
And his argument was mathematical. He was like, I figured out a way to parameterize it so I could just set it down in front of somebody and have them look at it and tell me if it was viable or not. Because before then, I would go to mathematicians and physicists and they would be like, write it down. Like, it's a cool theory, but I, I, don't, I, don't, have the time to, I don't have the time to do the math for you. Yeah. And so you basically have to like put it together in some way where you can stick it in front of somebody's nose in a short enough way. You know, like a, a one page white paper and be like, look at it. Well, I think that's and, exactly what Milinkovic did. <laughs> hmm. And if it's more than one page, if it's a hundred pages, then they're going to be like, yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> and you've, re- uh, you've reduced your subset of people who can critique you from a million to like a couple thousand. And so then they're like, yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to back check you. But so. Anyway. How does yeah. it go ahead? I just want to say, like the the gravity the gravity waves thing. I, I'm I'm deeply skeptical of gravity waves by themselves, just because they've been so. There's for, this is for two Sh- re- one of Shiloh's favorite topics, and I'm amazed by how much restraint he's showing. Not really. Now. I actually didn't want to talk about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just I feel like I, I'm gonna not be uh, doing service to uh, some I, of our community members if please, I don't at please. least like voice it. But um, there's just been so few of these events detected, considering how many. Uh, should be expected, um, which makes me nervous. But on top of that, I think that it's a little bit of a, what should I say? Cop out? It's a, it's a little bit of a cop out to explain something based on gravity waves when you don't really understand gravity in the first place. Yeah. And so, not you, know, you specifically. Not you personally. One. I'm sorry. Yeah. Not, I'm not attacking you. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just throwing it out there that, um, you know, we say stuff like, oh, well, space and time is distorted. But when you really push on those ideas a little bit, what you're saying is that we the trajectories of bodies near other bodies changes, like right, like space time is a very tight description of the way things appear to to go down. It doesn't actually explain what's causing one atom to do that to the other atom, and so that's what science should really be striving for, in my opinion. And you know, it may very well be the case that uh, pulses of gravity like once we come to understand what is actually happening between atoms to cause that attraction fundamentally then maybe we can start to like blame things on it and and start to make sense of it but but i can also just imagine it as being like a momentary increase in density like density scales yeah exactly if we're we're moving through different density regions right if these ripples to me is like okay so gravity wave i don't know what a gravity wave is but i'm just like okay so you go through a different density area and you have like weird dipoles absolutely yeah no it doesn't significantly like change what we're talking about here which is that you know there's there's obviously a procession through the galaxy and we should certainly expect that different regions of that galaxy are going to have completely different gravitational electromagnetic uh, milieus, right? It's going to be a totally different world everywhere we go. And it makes sense just looking at galaxies. You know, we obviously can't look at our own galaxy that well, but looking at other galaxies, like they seem to be periodic, right? There seems to be different regions that are all more or less the same. And yeah, I like it. It's a a fascinating idea. That's like a super good point too. That's like a lot of those, especially when it comes to physics, I think that there's these buzzwords and these like cool topics like a gravity wave. And it's when I use it, it's kind of like, well, that's what's popular now. Even though, like I said before, I, I'm pretty sure that we don't get it. Like, yeah, I, I like that you gave that. We think they are, but let's use that for now. Sure. In my mind, because hopefully we'll figure out what it actually is. And it'll. And if you make friends with the people who are working on that, maybe you know, maybe even if they're not right, you'll it'll give you some insight into into something that will you know help move us all forward too. Yeah. I also like that it has a connection to physical things that are moving and that they move other material, right? So you have these two big heavy things and they're moving around each other and they're going to have a periodicity and that periodicity is going to move everything that's in between you and them and out beyond you. And so it doesn't seem like, even if the details of like what exactly a gravity field is are, are you know, not worked out in the slightest, it doesn't change the fact that I'm like, you would expect two rotating objects to have an effect of course, on the material. Of course, a periodic effect. effect. Yeah, that might like, they would interfere, construct and interfere, and yeah, that that's quite interesting. You've you've stumbled upon one of our biggest problems with with science, which is that a lot of modern physics is mathematical physics as opposed to being material physics. 
And so when you start to drill down to the basis of what is an atom, what is light, what is gravity, you get that it's a quantum electric field. Right. It's and you're like, like what's quantum a field? field dynamics. <laughs> and a, a field is a set of vectors that change over time. And so you drill down to the bottom of physics and you're basically like, so it's a, it's a, it's a computer simulation? Like it's, it's, it's just math? And people there are like, well, yeah, it's just, it, it is. People are usually just like, shut up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who let this guy in here? And so this is like, this is one of the things that we do the, pro the, the program for, is that we really want to be able to talk to mathematical physics and figure out what is actually down there. Because it feels like there should be something material. And if you want to say that there's something immaterial somewhere else, like we can talk about the spirit especially in the context of biology, all you want. And we... The motivation, psyche, and so all synonyms. That's what Dr. Vanderbury means by spirit. And like conscious agents and like the one consciousness. Or, we just had a really crazy conversation about consciousness. And so like there is definitely a cleavage between physics and biology and that cleavage is consciousness. And you, but before you get to consciousness, you have to have stuff. Right. So then, so building on that, right? Because that's a whole can of worms. So, because I believe in some kind of a wave model, right? So, there's some kind of wave radiating out, and that that actually changes the um, the pull of the Earth. But then, so how does that relate to the electromagnetic pull, right? Because that's huge. And what if this wave actually affects like the electromagnetic pull as well as the geographic North Pole? And is there an interrelationship between the two? You know, I. I don't know. I don't trust most of the models on, on, because I mean, that's pretty big because right now it's happening, right? We know that our like pull strength is like degraded, like 30% over and it's moving super rapidly, way more rapidly than it has in the last hundred years. Why is that happening? Right. And is it completely a dynamo in the center of the earth? I think that's archaic thinking, or is this wave like this double interference wave pattern that's emanating out from our galactic core, right? That's forming all these waves that we orbit through do we go through them in a periodicity and do they affect our sun? Right. I was going to say the sun too, right? Like, is the sun a repeater? Like, does it strengthen the signal? Is it amplifying this or what's going on with there's, all that? There's so many ideas in fringe science that have to do with kind of that electric universe idea, but let's try and ground it in, in established physics. But, but I think that the fringe people are onto something and hopefully the mainstream like progresses to where they envelop all those they're able to explain those fringe ideas. But we, we all know that electricity has something to do with it and the electromagnetic poles have something to do with it. You know what? I think like, they're like opening up to it more. We we had a few NASA people on the show and uh, we kind of like push them a little harder like about stars forming and stuff. And they're like, you know, they give the normal like textbook, gravity did this explanation. But then you're like, well, what was there any chemistry going on? They're like, yeah. And then you're like, well, was there any charge separation amongst these chemicals? You know, like you can kind of get them to be like, okay, fine. Like there's a lot of stuff going on besides gravity, but it's just not written in the literature. Like it's not a, it's not an obsession the same way that gravity is for whatever reason. Right. Um, but you know, honestly, just like, I, I love, uh, looking out at astrophysics and cosmology right now too, because it's such, it's only been a hundred years since people stopped doing mechanical physics. Like that was the norm for most of human history. And it's, you know, it's easy to see how that, how those tables could turn just like it was the norm before that, uh, you know, geology that the earth was 6,000 years old or something. Right. That was like very seriously entertained. Um, just like it's very seriously entertained now that, you know, physics doesn't require a material basis. You know, these these paradigms can shift radically and, and rather quickly. So, yeah, who, who's to say what's going to happen in the near future? Yeah, yeah, where do you think the 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 greatest support for this theory lies right now? Like, are there are there older papers that talk about this? I mean, because I know that Hopgood has the cross slip theory. I know that there was a couple other people that were around the same time, but. Is there is there kind of a bastion of 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 axiomatic understanding that people point to, or that you could point to, and basically be like, look, this group of people seems like they were on the right track at least, because I feel like you can point to that in in something like you know material physics. Before. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I feel like most of the people who like kind of now at least people who support Hapgood, like I. 
I feel like they don't have a good handle on geology itself. Like they're, they're too far in that catastrophist mindset. And so like, I think one of my thoughts goes with them. Um, what is that? That YouTube channel of the dude who, oh God, some suspicious observers. Have you ever seen mm. him? Yeah, mm-hmm. Ben. Ben Davidson. Right. Do you guys know him? Answer our emails, Ben. <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> Love of God. Okay. So like Ben is, Ben is a great example. Like he's got, he reminds me of me before I went to school, right? Like he's, he's passionate about what he believes and he's onto something. He's got so many ideas that he's like, yeah, you like you're passionate about it. And so you've researched this as much as anybody and you know what you're talking about in lots of different, you know, bodies, even though you're not really part of the establishment. And if you went to school, you would like be able to educate your ideas and, and swing with the best of them. But then he's, he, he like is so into hap good. And then he goes into the geology of things. And every time he touches the geology, I'm like, Oh man, dude, you need to make friends with a geologist because you're just not making any sense when it comes mm. to the geology. You're so you're off. You're just off. You haven't seen the evidence. You don't get it. You need. And that's probably how I am when it comes to physics, you know, like I get into physics stuff and I realize, Hey, I need like somebody who's really spent their whole life in this, who can kind of like educate my ideas, you know? And I, I think, I think that's. I mean, I'll, I think that's how scientists sound to one another, though, too, right? Because you yeah. you can really only learn like a ton about like one thing, you know. Like, it's I hear like, an engineer two start talking about biology sometimes, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Right. I, I mean, I think it's cool though that you you you're able to look at s- something like suspicious observers or whatever, or the EU or something, and be like, okay, there's some cool ideas here. Right. Like maybe like whereas. Whereas a lot of people coming from the establishment will like, even if they see cool ideas, they're just like, screw this because that's completely wrong. Therefore, everything is wrong. It's like this baby with the bathwater immune response where you're just like, oh, no, it's garbage. Like, oh, they, they don't understand this thing about geology. Therefore, everything is just crap. And uh, I think that's, that's an equally uh, terrible mistake to make. Yeah, that hurts science. But he, he's, I think, an example of like somebody who's like the majority of people go into Hap good stuff and all this stuff from the fifties before plate tectonics really um, grabbed hold. They're, they're off. Their geology isn't good. They need to kind of like, we need to harmonize like those hap good followers and modern geology, which is what I'm, I'm trying to do. Yeah. Cause you look back onto, you know, if you go, if you, if you go too far back in scientific history, you start getting to really crazy stuff. Yeah. Right. So there's utility in going back a little ways and getting big picture ideas and kind of understanding, okay, well, this was a theory. This is something that I'm finding as I'm researching expansion tectonics, where it's you can really only go so far back because then you start getting information about assumed dates and organization of things. And especially when you're talking about the origin of the ocean basins, a lot of the imaging has come in the last 30, 40 years, probably a lot of it has come in the last 10. Yeah. And so the conclusions that they make from these very, very grainy images of the seafloor are big picture, maybe kind of in the right direction, but you can't base a theory of, of science off of something that hasn't been updated. Yeah. Do you have a, like, it's interesting to me because back in, when, when was it? The 20th, early 20th century? It seemed like for a moment there, expansion tectonics and uh, continental drift were both being equally entertained for just a moment. Yeah. More than Do you have a moment. sense for why continental drift won that uh, battle royale? Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, so like, we're going to start with, um, let's just talk plate tectonics. And, and expansion kind of in general, because I think all this fits into the idea of, of true God. And I wish we would hit this right from the beginning. There are like two true polar wander, the difference between true polar wander and apparent polar wander. Let's try and hit that in a second too. <clears throat> okay. So when they're trying to explain basically mountain formation, as well as um, ocean basin formation, like what's creating the ocean basins, what's creating mountains, folds, um, Right, the the original idea that maybe the Earth was expanding and contracting, that contracting is like creating mountains, expanding is like creating ocean basins. The big problem I think with that is the same one that exists today. People in their minds think that they have to be adding or subtracting from the mass of the Earth to change the size of the Earth. So then, what kind of of a <clears throat> mechanism do you have to add to or take away from the mass of the Earth? 
I, I would host like, and, and I see that so much when you read about literature where people are exploring those ideas, because they're still, they still are interesting ideas. And we don't need, to, we, we never, this is a mistake. I think a lot of people who are into expansion tectonics make, they try and throw out plate tectonics, modern plate tectonic theory in lieu of expansion tectonics. That is a bad move. It's dumb. You're never going to convince everyone with that because there's so much evidence that actual plate tectonics is happening, at least by the centimeters and millimeters. And you need to accept that and you need to like say it happens and it is happening. So there is subduction on subduction zones. There is ridge push on ridges, right? There is slab pull on slabs. <clears throat> and one of the most well-respected uh, expansionists uh, was this museum curator named H, I think it's H.G. Owen, who wrote this uh, big cartography piece uh, that laid it out. And, and he was absolutely entertaining the idea that that Tech, plate tectonics was compatible with the expansion model. And I think that's why he was taken seriously for so long. Yeah. And I think that's how everyone should hit it. That both of them, if if expansion tectonics is indeed a real thing, first of all, has nothing to do with losing or, or gaining. Right. It has everything to do with density. Right, it's right. It's just like a balloon raising up through the atmosphere. It's not changing mass at all. It's just some kind of pressure variant is changing. So that's expanding or contracting. And the second of all, plate tectonics is happening, but then really hit the, the the heart of plate tectonics. You know, what it explained so well was, you know, like what we saw on the seafloor, that there are seafloor spreading areas and there are subduction events. We see them really well. But what they what it doesn't explain is the geomorphology of mountain chains, right? The geomorphology of where things occur does not fit plate tectonics very well. Okay, and, and that's something like we have to hop on Google Earth again. Okay, so some of the things I just want to like point out. So number one would be where oceanic crust meets continental crust, right? So continental crust is like 40 times thicker or more, sometimes maybe like 150 times thicker than oceanic crust. So if you've got like this oceanic crust, that's like a paper and it's pushing like this fat, thick continental crust, right? You would expect that where the two meet, essentially, you should, you should have mountain chains. Does that make sense? Like whenever, if you have an oceanic crust, right? Because we have a conveyor belt, this is on the predominant model of, of mantle, right? So upper mantle convection current is like moving this, this ocean plate along. We'll just picture the Atlantic, you know, on the coast of Africa or something like that. And then it, it should, as it moves, buckle. When yeah, it should, it should basically crust, hit and right. right because you've got something tiny pushing something that's super fat and even though they're both riding on the same convection cell that doesn't matter the the thin one should buckle and mm. pushes up against the thin ones so not now, is it what what about the density between those two yeah, it's crazy i looked this up the other day and everybody's always like well the the continental crust is thicker but the oceanic crust is denser and so i had in my mind the fact that the density difference was on the same order of magnitude as their thickness differences uh, like, it's insane it's like 2.7 yeah. grams uh per cubic centimeter for the two, continental six, nine. <laughs> yeah 269 versus 3 I see, I see. But they're literally like 10 times, like the continental plate is between six and 10 times bigger than the oceanic plate. I and see. the density thing is always given as this kind of like balancing thing. And yeah. I was just floored by it. Yeah. Mm. Like really, you should see some kind of deformation every time an con- uh, oceanic plate hits a continental plate. Not because they're moving together. They're moving to, not because they're moving toward each other. They're moving together. But still, you've got something so small, right? trying to move something so much more massive you should just see a little bit of deformation and you never do right almost never there's not i mean the appellations you could say well maybe that's an example even though it's really not like and is it is it possible that it's there it's just been worn away by the oceans or, or are we talking about we, no. we, we, we no. see it we know it like <laughs> you, you've looked yeah yeah as a geologist if there was a mountain there at one time and it's worn away we know it you know there's going to be a schist or a nice or something there that shows the metamorphism so it's like it it doesn't exist. And and it should be like all over and it doesn't exist all over there's problems with it. But then there's even more problems with like the way that that the mountains are formed just alone, right? Like so the Andes and the Rocky Mountains they're where they should be. You've got two converging plates. So yeah, you should have like two plates. This I mean I wish I could visualize this a little better. 
So every convection cell should have its entire edge should be a mountain chain where that mountain is then converging with another plate, right? But like the way that the mountains are, are formed don't fit the subduction zones very well. They actually end up fitting a like a sinusoidal pull to pull um, stress field better. And what I mean by that is so let's look at North and South America, the Andes and Rockies go pull to pull, right? And then, and that one kind of seems like, well, that one, that one kind of works, right? They're going, there's a subduction zone, just like we see they're pulling away. That seems like it works pretty well with plate tectonics. But then we look at the Eurasian mountain chain and suddenly it's like, well, that one doesn't really seem like it works very well because you've got this mountain chain that essentially starts in the, the Alps and goes through Bulgaria, through the Black Sea Caucasus, right? Through Iran, through the Himalayas, down through Malaysia and Indonesia, around to New Zealand, essentially pull to pull. Like look at it in a globe and really just like, like I used to draw these things on a globe. I have so many globes in my house and I used to like make all these little cutouts. Like the mountain chain over there goes pull to pull. But it's kind of like it's a different pull to pull. It's a pull that would be like a Greenland pull. Like this is the pull to pull to that mountain. And it totally, it's really sinusoidal, but it, it's more pull to pull. And a lot of the areas just don't even have subduction zones next to them. You know, and they try to explain that away. Like the Alps, there's no subduction zone really there. And they're like, well, there was one. It's an ancient subduction zone. And, but then area after area, they have to be like, well, there's an ancient subduction zone. You can't see the evidence anymore. But it's like, well, you're using kind of circular logic there. That may or may not be true. Maybe it is true, but maybe you're just trying to explain away what you see. And maybe there's a better explanation. To me, I think there maybe is a better explanation. Like if, if we do see, if there are periodic pole shifts through the history of geology, right? And I'm not talking about the kind of pole shifts that like cause the flood, but, but there are like the biblical flood, anyway. there are pole shifts and they do create mountains over long periods of time. Right. And like, like I said before, we got to find that balance between uniformitarianism and catastrophism. From oh, yeah, what's the, 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 the bending of the crust, so like as the pole shifts, it basically warps the crust in this way where it's like it slips over itself. Yeah, because if, if you have a pole shift, you're going to have mountain building. And that's another one of the arguments against like a, a rapid polar wandering event with the Ice Age, right? They, a lot of people would say, if you, if you pitch that idea to them and say, look, the pole looked like it was over Greenland during the Ice Age. And they're like, what, it shifted over a thousand years or over a hundred years? No way, that ripped the earth apart. You'd be like, no, we don't know exactly how fast it it shifted. Maybe it was over 100 years, maybe it was over 2,000 years, but it was slow enough that it didn't cause huge mountains to raise, but it did change stress fields completely, that there is a rotational velocity inherent in the earth. And when you shift it in some way, you're going to create a whole new stress regime and the plates are then going to move it to this new stress regime. And that is going to be reflected by being a pull to pull type of stress regime, mm. right? Like take something, take a top and, and turn it like that. You're going to see a pull to pull deformation in some way. And that's what, that's what our mountains show. Like the two main mountain chains on earth is the one that goes from the current pole to the current South pole, which is North America to South America, the Andes to the Rockies, all the way into Alaska. And what's the other one? The other one really seems like it goes like basically from Greenland to Australia. Like it goes through the Alps and through the Himalayas and through Malaysia and through Indonesia and to New Zealand. We're looking at, so is this the, the Alpide belt? Yeah. Okay, we're, we're looking at a picture of it right now. Yeah. Um, is there, are there, are there difficulties in figuring out how old the rocks are? Like, would you expect the rocks to all be kind of the same age? Would you not expect that at all? How would you, how would, if you were to try to figure out if it did come from a, one event, what are the geologic tools that you would have available to you to actually like piece that apart? It seems like an unbelievable challenge. So I, I wouldn't suggest it came from one event. It's easy to date mountains and it's even easier to date these synclinal basins that form adjacent to mountains. For every uplift, there's typically a down drop. For every upfold, there's a downfold, an incline, a syncline, right? A mountain belt and a synclinal basin. So it's easy to, to date those. And it definitely, so don't, but don't think I'm trying to say that these mountains were formed in single events. I'm saying that these events happen like every 14,000 years for the last however many million years. 
And actually when they happen, they happen slow enough that they are creating new stress regimes, but then maybe those stress regimes manifest over the next 5,000 years. Like maybe we still have mountains rising from the last time they switched and when it switches again, there'll be a new stress regime, but that they, it doesn't happen quick enough to change the course of rivers. You know, it's interesting how cyclic stress too, uh, is actually in some cases a more strong deformer than just a single application of a shear force. You thinking of like the Tacoma Narrows? I was thinking about that. Uh, what was this like video of like trying? This guy made like a Lego machine that was like trying to wear out these pieces of metal. Did, you showed me this like five years ago. But there's something about just cycling things very quickly too that actually does lead them to uh, to fail in a in a way that's actually I believe that it can be uh, faster than if you just apply the same. Uh, some force in one blow or something like, like that. bending a piece of metal to break it type thing yeah you've done this before too right you take like a spoon or something and you can just like yeah. break it yeah. and maybe the s waves or the in an earthquake kind of could do a similar thing hmm. um, but i mean my point really is that the, like the changes are happening slowly you know repeatedly speaking but yeah repeatedly and so, so slowly but then adding up on the surface in various ways that you can kind of piece together by by looking at these patterns that remain on the surface for sure for sure like the rocky mountains you know we know that the rocky mountains have been raising since at least the in cretaceous right uh, the layer they, and rocky. they're still growing yeah and they Do shouldn't be growing because there's not really a subduction zone there anymore well there is they have explanations for why there's, there's thin skin versus thick skin deformation. And they believe that the slab angle of the seducting Pacific plate, you know, was very steep early on, but then it actually kind of flattened out. And so then it's kind of doing this. And so it's deforming way inland. Do you, do you have an imagination for what this pole shift looks like? Like uh, for, for an observer sitting on earth? Or, or like is it? Is it? Or, or do you imagine the experience of the pole shift? Yeah. Okay. Is it? A, is it an experience, or is it something that happens over so many generations that it's just sort of folded into, you know, the day to day? It's it's hard to wrap my head around it. Like so, like I mean, a creationist would say, "Oh, this happens like in a person's lifespan, right?" Like Joshua held the sun still, and so obviously the pole is shifting, you know. Or I, I, it's been a while, but there's other biblical examples. For me, it's hard to kind of like imagine the pull making a complete shift like in a single day without it kind of like making massive mountain chains. You know, there's just so much change in angular momentum. So then I kind of picture something that maybe is happening slower that actually more maybe takes a hundred years or maybe even a thousand years. Um, but I don't, like, I don't know. I And I, I don't want to like, I don't want to take sides. Yeah, I, I didn't expect that you like have an answer. I'm just curious, like when you imagine it in your head, you know, it's just like it's probably something you think a lot about. I, I just wonder if you if you imagine it as an event or or just as this drift process. Or, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't of course know we don't know. It happen fast without making just ruining everything. Catastrophe, you know. Right. But is there any evidence for anything like that uh, archaeologically that you're aware of, or uh, like? not a major catastrophe but do, do like any extinctions cluster around these i mean i guess it'd be hard to separate out from glaciation you'd just be like well yeah it got cold yeah and and the, and the extinction events you know there's like a periodicity that people have tried to find somewhere around like 30 million years every 30 million years it's like a huge extinction not even that is very greatly constrained you know like it's not it's not really a great periodicity you have to kind of fudge things to make it fit into that but okay so and i and i talked about this before like so if, if there is a change, right, let's, let's just say it happens over a hundred year period or a 200 year period, right? It's definitely going to change sea level, right? Whatever it is, it's going to create huge stresses. There are going to be changes in the geography. Those changes are going to be slow enough that they don't affect the course of most rivers. Most rivers are able to keep up because that's the number one evidence, like I said before, like any archaeological evidence, anything you find is going to pale in consider in comparison to the to the number one evidence that I think exists, which is are rivers changing their course or aren't they? Mm -hmm. Right. No fast mountains. There are not many fast mountains. Right. These river every all the changes have to happen slow enough that the Colorado River or whatever these the the, the 
um, Columbia River going through the Columbia River Gorge, it's able to keep up, right, with whatever changes that are happening. So we know it's happening at least that slow, right? Um, but yeah, what does that what does that look like? I don't know. And and I don't I don't think it'd be smart for like a science for especially me trying to push this theory that I think is obvious. I don't think it's smart to try and pretend that you know. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah, but the uh, because there's not evidence. You can't you can't find great evidence. Oh yeah, okay. But the one thing I was going to talk about is that it's going to change radiocarbon dates. That's something that we should all keep in mind. Yeah, let's let's unpack that. Let's do that. I, I do think that we we are we don't totally understand the elastic properties of, or I don't at least. Maybe somebody does understand the elastic properties of the crust enough to really weigh in how much of a beating the the crust could take before it fractured or or broke into a mountain or something like that. Yeah, and good I, point. Yeah, I, I just because uh, I think that most of the 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 derivations of this are done on relatively small pieces of material that is then extrapolated to much larger pieces of material. And there's an assumption that there's going to be a relatively linear translation. But it's so heterogeneous as it is. You know, we started off the podcast talking about different colorings, right? And and you can imagine just completely different elastic moduli for different regions. And it gets to be this like multifactorial calculation at some point. I'm, I mean, maybe there's somebody we could talk to that could answer that question. But like a lot of, a lot of people assume that it's like, if you take this huge, massive body and let's say that you're, it's almost like there's a bar through the middle and you're just cranking it. And so if you do that, then there should be like massive changes in the crust, but maybe that's not how it's going down. Maybe gravity itself is changing, right? Like, so if we're going through these gravity waves and so there's actually some kind of external change in the gravity of the earth as it's inertially, changing, yeah, yeah. Then, then maybe it's not like it's all being moved kind of together. And so it's not such a massive jerk as we think. But I mean, one thing people often forget about, uh, but it's that the fact no one that the forgets. gravitational constant changes sometimes. <laughs> no, Most people forget. No, doctor. Well, I mean, <laughs> one one thing that all of all of modern physics is predicated on is the idea that inertia and gravity are the same, and and obviously. But there's this huge controversy because I think that it was Penrose who wrote about this. Who basically he was like, look, G would change. Big G would change. Like people's recordings of Big G sometimes vary tremendously, and they've never been able to get it down to like a very precise measurement that is always the same in all labs that measure it. And this is often an argument that expansion tectonics proponents make: is that G changed. Well, and along those lines, you know, in so much as inertia is, you know, as Mach put it, inertia is essentially us being connected to everything around us. Um, if everything around you changes, then your inertial conditions could change too. And Yeah, yeah. and it, it definitely opens the door to catastrophism in a way where you're just like, well, things really changed. And you're like, well, yes, maybe, but that's hard to, it's a hard thing to put together. Like we talked a while ago to Don Petit, who is an active duty NASA astronaut. And when he was at the University of Oregon, he got really into the question of how is it possible that these dinosaurs, these pterosaurs, which are the size of giraffes, how could they fly? Right? right, they're too big to fly. If you look at the mouse to elephant curves, the mouse to elephant curves don't add up. They're like way off. They're they're with all these like mechanical gliders that have been built. So they're too big. And so him and his supervisor came up with a theory where they were basically like, look, the the atmosphere had to have been thicker. And he's tortured by this because he's like, I don't have proof because you can't prove atmospheric density. You can only prove composition, even that by proxy. And yeah. he's tortured by it because he thinks that it's the case. He's like, there's no other reasonable explanation, but there's no way to get it to be accepted by the community because there's not a mathematical proof that you can make that ties into some kind of molecule that you can point to and be like, this is the molecule that proves it. Yeah. I mean, so something I've wondered a lot about is the size of animals through the geologic record. Right, so during the ice age, we just had massive animals. You had beavers the size of bears, and bears three times bigger than they are now. And anyway, there was there was massive animals, um, and then you see that in other parts of the geologic record too. Like the dinosaurs themselves, you know, they're kind of small in the Permian, and then suddenly they get massive through the Cretaceous. Like, what's causing them to get so big? Why why in the Eocene did you get rhinoceroses that were as big as dinosaurs essentially? like 30 foot tall rhinoceroses in Kansas. And um, what, why during these certain periods of time do you get giganticism essentially of the fauna and, and even the plants? 
And these are things that I think that science is just kind of like, don't look at that. Don't worry about it. Right. <laughs> well, it's just, just like stuff happened. I don't know. <laughs> and it it's baffling because, I mean, I, I have kind of a conspiratorial bent about it where I'm like, we live in a society in a world where the answer is we will stop the planet from changing. <laughs> I, that's that's that that's the technological arc. Not only will we, this is what transhumanism is. This is what the like technotopia that we're that we're on the verge of. Engin- ah, damn it! I said it again. <laughs> Engineering. Ah, have to bleep all yeah, this time. Like, because we talked to a guy who works at Harvard in solar geoengineering, and he's like, "This is all theoretical at this point, but we're figuring out how to like spray the spray the atmosphere in order to stop the weather from changing." Oh God, we're so <laughs> screwed <laughs> on this. <laughs> we'll work it out. We'll work it out. We'll bleep it all. Um, but the point is that there is a deep seated belief in the fact that we're going to be able to stop the stuff from changing. Yeah. Because the changes are super predictable. Super predictable and the changes right now are happening largely because of human activity. And again, any time that I say this, I have to start with the caveat of humans are dicks and we have completely trashed the place. <laughs> right, right. But then I have to go to the point <laughs> of like the atmosphere. <laughs> We're not excusing you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's Stop. like it's not excusing you, yeah. but we Stop peeing in the water. Like, please, can we be reasonable? <laughs> can we really discuss the absolute absurdity of the stuff that you find in the geologic record and how poorly it is that we understand? Yeah. And you know, I like to compare it to is like the sacrifice to the gods. <laughs> like essentially in the past, nature has always been something that's incredibly frightening because we cannot control it. And that volcano could just destroy your civilization at any moment. And so let's grab some virgins and go throw them in, you know, and that is going to appease the gods. And basically it gives us this feeling of control because the, the feeling of not being able to control what could just kill us, you know, it's, it's so frightening. It's so anxiety producing that we have to come up with some kind of a social um, drug essentially to, to calm our anxiety and pretend like we can control the uncontrollable. That's, well, that's exactly what we're it. Doing today. You know, we're, we're like coming up with so many excuses where it's like, well, it's us, all of the changes that are happening in the earth are us and we can control them. We can throw that virgin into the volcano and it won't erupt. But, but like from a geologist, like I, I sorry, that's how we are with medicine too, right? And a lot of things too. It's like, well, if you just live healthier and like eat the right stuff or something, like maybe you can avoid disease. And it's like sometimes, but like you know, right? right. It's like sometimes you can't control it. Yeah, but you're and, saying that like, and that's unbearable. Honestly, that's sort of unbearable, right? It's yeah. like, yeah, like totally. oh my, like just, There's also just jump off a cliff. bias because all of the civilizations who successfully staved off destruction by throwing virgins into the cauldron are going to be the ones that are writing the stories. <laughs> right. <And> so <laughs> it works. Yeah, right. exactly. Basically, right. like this has worked every time they've tried it. Right. From a, from a geologic perspective, like the the temperature on Earth fluctuates wildly right? Like things just change so much. Sea level fluctuates wildly. And so then, and and we're looking at everything, just like seeing these cycles being like, well, it's just dumb to live by the ocean, you know? But but then what, I guess the counter argument to that would be like, well, yeah, we know that the geologic record shows that the temperature of the earth goes between the ice age and and not, you know, periodically and nothing that people could do could stop that. But now it's happening way faster. But this is where what I was talking about with radiocarbon dating comes in. Okay, so radiocarbon dating, if what I'm saying is right, and if there have been rapid true polar wandering events, then radiocarbon dating is not correct. I'm not saying how how off it is, but it's not correct. Because radiocarbon dating has to assume, essentially, that the ratio between carbon dioxide with its stable, you know, carbon 12 and radiocarbon, you know, carbon 14 or carbon 13, that those carbon isotopes, that ratio has been essentially stable historically. Any changes that we have in that ratio change our dates, right? And scientists use all sorts of proxies to try and kind of come up with ideas on how they, how they aren't constant and how they changed. And then that's how you get the intercal curves where they're, they're trying to correct them, right? But and what what I believe is that their their correction curves are not nearly radical enough. Like they're trying to make these little 100, 200 year tweaks 
when when we get back to the ice age though i think it's probably off by thousands of years right so we can we can use dendrochronology for the last 2000 years and we can tree rings yeah exactly we can do a tree ring and we can radiocarbon data and we can be like okay yeah look it's pretty ripe and there's some spikes here that show where we're off but we can figure out where they're off but as soon as we get older in 2000 years now we have to stop using these ultra stable redwoods and sequoias and switch to things like um bristlecone pines right and and that's where radiocarbon dating starts get, or dendrochronology at least starts getting iffy right because the chances that a bristlecone pine only grows one ring a year are pretty slim right just just look at it logically and you think like if there's any if there's any tree that's going to grow more than once a year what's the climate going to be like where it lives probably somewhere that has like i don't know a hundred freeze thaw cycles in a year that can go from being 50 degrees in the middle of the day to like the next week snowing like it's gonna be a bristlecone pine they all live at 10,000 feet don't trust that tree <laughs> don't when they tell you that that tree is like four thousand years old don't trust it because common sense tells you that tree's probably not growing more, you know, it's probably not growing just one ring a year. And there's actually studies that have shown that. I was gonna say, it's probably mostly right, but we shouldn't trust exactly. But then even that, once we get more than 4,000 years ago, there really isn't even dendrochronology that's at all trustable. We're having to piece together trees and stuff that's so untrustable and built on such, you know, basically guesswork, essentially. Wishful thinking. I, th- I, remember, seeing a, I remember seeing a paper where they were studying I think that it was a native settlement and they had a bunch of different pieces of wood that had gotten petrified, but they were like, the settlements were spread out from all over the place. And so they put them together and they were basically like, okay, so this must have been the time period that they were from, but it was basically just like three logs that they were like, this is a good proxy for for the measurement. And it might be, I don't know. What I was going to ask is how good petrified wood is. Like, can you use petrified forests for any of this stuff or is it just... Too not weird. at all. Not at mm. all. In fact, you can't really even see tree rings very often in the petrified wood. The rings get replaced. But even if they did, it wouldn't matter because we're talking about apples and oranges there. You know, petrified wood, you, you're you going to have to use argon, argon, uranium, probably uranium dating usually to try and get a date if you can. So radiocarbon dating is only good up to like, you know, between 40 and maybe some people might try and make it go 100, 120,000 years ago. Totally different dating method than geologic dating, right? We're talking completely different timelines, and maybe they're maybe they're both. Anyway, we won't get into. Well, there's a fundamental premise which is similar in both, which is that your concentration of the denominator stays pretty steady, right? Where it's just like the amount of uranium that's available through time is stable. The amount of carbon twelve, carbon thirteen, carbon fourteen that's available through time is steady. There's there's ways that you can do. You don't actually even have to to work with that. So like when it comes to geology dating, right? We're talking about different things and maybe we don't even want to get into that weeds. Like I took a geochronology in school, like a graduate class. And there's so many different ways that they can try and get away from changes in the numerator or the denominator that really what you're, what the assumption you're working on is that the decay rate is constant over time. That's Which, if you start to push on that, you run into questions too. I, I really wanted to make a movie a long time ago, like maybe a year or two ago, about radio, radio, just radiometric dating in general. And it is a, it is, it is a deep field. Like it's, it's. There's a lot of explanations for every little thing that you come up with. Um, it's a hard one to push on because it's like a whack-a-mole system, like new problems crop like new uh defenses crop up and they all also seem in some ways questionable i came i found this uh, stanford professor who had established that actually radioactive decay rates were uh, uh, uh i can't remember of what nuclei but they they were changing as the result of the sun cycle and uh i i has corresponded with this guy's name's peter Sturrock. Um, but he wouldn't come on the show. He he didn't want to talk about it. He's like an emeritus professor. And he's just like, I've had a good run. I think I'll just <laughs> cash it out right now. I'm like, okay, fair enough. Like, but uh, you know, if that if if radioactive decay rates aren't constants over eons, it's just like you know that's that that blow is again almost unimaginable for 
geology and, and archaeology and all these sciences for which that is essentially their only direct readout. It's like yeah. the quantitative, uh, you know, poster child for their discipline. Um, and I, I'd say kind of yes and no. Like, so the, the fact that neutrinos can affect, you know, I think that their, their study, and it's not just Stanford, but there were two schools that did studies on that. So that the neutrino influx is changing it, but by this infinitesimal amount, right? They're changing it so small, but it's it's happening like depending on the time of year it is. And then it's also happening during major coronal mass ejections from the sun. Like you're finding that the decay rates change probably from like this huge neutrino influx. So then the, the a creationist would read that and be like, oh, look, it could there could be 7,000 years ago old, you know? But then the professors with that would be like, no, we're talking about changes in like, uh, like microseconds <laughs> but then that you'd have to be like well what if these gravity waves or whatever the waves are that are like going through the galaxy what if at some time we go through these something that changes the very rules drastically so that suddenly there are like huge changes in decay rates so that maybe we can't trust our decay rates at all but then a geologist would say well we don't just need decay rates because we do have you know, tidal flat deposits, you know, where you can see like the tide coming in and out every day and it's depositing a layer <clears throat> and then the green river formation, you know, or there's layers in Argentina, all these different ones on, on earth, you know, we might have like a million different tidal layers in this, in this, in this stratigraphic layer. And the Moenkopi is a great, great example, even of, of like a very layer cake layer where you've got like a million layers and you're like, well, that, that couldn't have happened in a small amount of time. That couldn't have happened in 7,000 But they're years. spotty, right? Like you might have a million years here or there or something, but you don't have like a continuous tidal yeah, record. And that's that's a good argument too, because it's hard to tell whether it's continuous. You, when you're then there's missing areas and you've got like some kind of disconformity, you know, it's hard to tell how much time is missing there. We don't know. But and it, like, I don't imagine Sturrock or the other group uh, or anybody is like, has nailed the mechanism or anything like that. I just think it's fascinating that like, okay, well, we assume radioactive decay is constant no matter what. And it's like, well, it's not, first of all, it appears not to be regardless of how big or small that changes, which opens up this whole Pandora's box about like, well, what else could be influencing it? Like, if But every time that you Google this, you end up on a page where it's literally just creationist yeah, websites. Yeah, it's the second link for yeah. sure. It's super hard because on one hand, you've got creationists who are horrible scientists. And, but the, and then they almost create this antithesis of scientists who feel like they have to like shut down any exploration of thought when the truth is somewhere in the middle. And what, what I like to tell people is that like we sh all should understand that decay rates are relative. We don't know how relative they are, but that that date, when it gives us an answer, I everyone should just have an understanding that that is a relative date and that maybe it's in the ballpark, but it's the best we got. And so let's all go with it. Like, let's not try and shoot it down. Like if we're all going to say that, you know, the Claron formation dates to... That's probably a bad example because you can't really metrically date it if you use pollen studies. But like, so, so some layer like gives us a date at 55 million years ago. We're all going to go with that, but we're all going to understand that it's probably not true, but that it's closer to the truth than 7,000 years is probably. And it's probably more close to the truth the closer you are to now, right? It's like the further back, the weirder things get. Like I have a sneaking suspicion that this 4.5 billion year old uh, delineation that we have for the whole solar system and everything that we find is somehow reflective of an asymptote with the dating method because we now know there's interstellar meteors that have been hitting the earth for a long time and we've never found a meteor that's not four and a half billion years old something like that they're all at the same age and it seems like the oldest things we ever find are four and a half billion years and so the, the common interpretation is well that's the age of the solar system but that's that's starting to lose its footing a little bit. And so I, I just am, the further I look back in time, the more I'm kind of like, well, something else might be going on here. But I, I agree with you that like in, in the short run, these things make a lot of a sense, especially as first order approximations of when, and you can correlate them to the dendrochronography, you can correlate them to tidal stuff. There's lots of ways, uh, the stra uh, stratigraphic record with the fossils and you can get at least this, this was before and this was after. So I like how you put that with the, the relative it, it is essentially a relative dating mean
Yeah. Like take it all with a grain of salt, but at the same time, don't like use it to try and completely throw the baby out with the bath water. And definitely the older that you get, the less I trust it. Like if somebody's trying to make themselves famous saying that this happened at 1.2 billion years ago versus one, it's like, really? Yeah. We never. I love how you put a decimal on 1.2 in the first place. I mean, give me, I, anyway, I read that stuff and it just makes me laugh. Like, Anytime I see a decimal, like in a headline or something, I'm just like, <laughs> it's just so sneaky. Yeah. Even 4 billion versus 5 billion. It's like when you, the further back you get, the less you can trust the dates because yeah. the way the radiometric dating works is a tiny change in that decay constant, you know, makes massive changes the further back you go. Right. It's just the slope of a line ultimately. Yeah. And it's the same with the radiocarbon dates. So like I say, you can't, like everything is based on radiocarbon dating. Everything. Like it is the baseline and, and we trust it more than we should, in my opinion, because if there is rapid change in atmospheric composition, um, like carbon dioxide or radiocarbon, which there's lots of things that, like the, the change in the Earth's magnetic field, like right now we've seen massive changes in the Earth's magnetic field. If 5,000 years ago, we had a change equivalent to the change we've had in the last hundred years in the Earth's magnetic field, well, that drastically affects what we assume the radiocarbon le levels were back then. And so we can't trust the dates. But like I said before, we should use them. Like use them and let's all agree on them, but let's also all agree that they're probably not exactly right, but that they're close enough and they're the best we got. Because it seems like there's, there's, there's a deep desire to be able to date this stuff, right? You want to be able to say that there's a timeline and you can place events on the timeline. Well, it helps you explain the features, right? The, it it helps you come up with the mechanism. Yeah. And so there is a need to be able... First there was this, able, then there was this, and then this happened. And to be able to say, like, first there was this, then there was this, you want to be able to say roughly how long ago. Because I don't I mean, I don't know why. I why think, do, why, you need why do we care you need relative, about the, need, the deep age? Like, why do we care about how old the solar system is in terms of just versus... I mean, I can tell you why I care, but... <laughs> I mean, you just it helps you come up with a mechanism for how things happen, right? If you have the wrong date, like, say that they're completely wrong about this. The solar system didn't form four and a half billion years ago. It's just an asymptotic artifact of the dating method. Say the universe, or say the... Uh, did I say universe? Solar system. Say the solar system formed over billions and billions of years and even incorporated planets from other solar systems and these things like you can really get into a completely different paradigm for what it is what this place is how it came to look this way and geology kind of holds the keys to that because it is basically everything that we understand about our own earth is then used to understand the rest of the solar system absolutely. and the cosmos absolutely yeah and, and meteorites, including that our dating of the Earth and meteorites is basically what everything is hanging on. Like it is the geologic dating that determines everything when it comes to astrophysics, really. And, and radiocarbon dating, I wish people understood how dependent upon that. There's so much circular reasoning out there, even in our genetic studies of like how quickly genetic mutations happen. It's based on radiocarbon dating. It really is. And so we like to say, oh, we know how we know how old this species is because we can you know see how quick it's mutated and it's like well you're basing those on models that were based on radiocarbon dated animals so can you imagine an alternative to radiocarbon i mean this is a this is like nobel prize worthy and i don't i don't expect anybody to have an answer to it but do you think that there is a method that is better than radiocarbon or radiometric dating that we haven't figured out yet or do you think that attempting to just put decimal level certainty on dating is just a fool's game yeah i can't think of it like, like they've got you know fish and track dating and stuff like that but honestly it's based on the other dating methods i mean it'd be cool if they, they just in, instead of calling it a year they called it something else right like a radiological year or something like that where people could understand like oh well it is a unit that's relative to this scale, but like we don't know exactly what that means in terms of like mm. Earth years or something like that. Where you could, uh, you know, at least take away the arrogance of presuming that it's exact and precise, but you could at least give it the weight that it deserves, which yeah. is it's a real, relatively decent. And that kind of relative exists, dating scale, you know, because a, lo a lot of literature will call things radiocarbon years. So they won't call them actual years. They'll call them radiocarbon years, Nice. which is trying to, and they'll even try to differentiate now. They'll publish two different date sets, you know, one for um, the radiocarbon year and one for the adjusted calendar year. Oh, cool. So they're already doing that. That's, yeah. That's awesome. 
And so that that actually points to maybe things moving kind of in the right direction. Like I, I, we we spoke about this when we were on the phone before recording the episode, but this idea that it it must shift with time. Ideas roll over the people who were in school with you. Yes, some of them were the ones that were like, "Hey, this is totally right. I'm just going to memorize it and regurgitate it for the rest of my life." But there are other people like you who went through school and sat around and were like, well, I don't, I don't know about that. And geology is one of those really interesting things where people seem to become obsessed with it and they just carry it with them. Like maybe they're not a geologist, but they still love it and they think about it all the time. And Because it's one of those things that you go out into the world and you look at what is in front of you and you ask yourself the question, how did it come to look like this? Yeah. And so everybody's kind of an amateur geologist. Anybody who's ever asked the question, why does it look like this, is an amateur geologist. And the more that people can write about what are the possible explanations for how it could have come to look like this to get people thinking. And if people are already starting to be like, well, our radiometric scales are maybe squishier than we thought that they were before. I don't know. I I always I always leave these conversations with a lot of hope because I think that there is a lot of people who are very curious and driven to understand how to make a future that doesn't involve trashing everything that came before. Like what you've said about plate tectonics being worthwhile to keep. It's just like expansion I mean, tectonics. It's a really good sign that there that you exist, uh, yeah. Lance. Like that there's a guy out there who's working, you know, for state a geology operation and is able to entertain these ideas, right? Like the the requisite indoctrination isn't so strong that that you don't that you feel alienated enough to not be there. Like you obviously, I assume you enjoy your your work and yeah, and, uh, the people that you work with and yeah, and yeah. That's I, a, I think that's a good sign. <laughs> I think both like in a school environment and in a professional environment, I've been in groups that like just trash the fringe people you know just sit around and and it's it's hard not to sometimes because the theories can be kind of out there and crazy but but i've told my colleagues and i've told you know just i, I think i mentioned it to you like I, I i think that we should all preserve the right of creationists to exist and all french theorists and their stuff should get out there because even though like the professional community might not agree with them, they are going to be what pushes the envelope. They're going to be the ones that find the holes in our paradigm. They're going to be the ones that push us to like really make sure that we know our stuff. And honestly, from the ranks of them, I think some of the major discoveries end up getting made. Like so many of the professional community started out in those like religious environments. And, and that's, what, that's how it was with me. That's what drove me to want to know everything. I think without my like kind of religious upbringing that pushed creationism to a small extent, I wouldn't be nearly as good as a scientist. Like we need to encourage that kind of stuff because then those people go into the educational system and they question everything and they end up kind of like finding the breakthroughs. Man, that's such a good argument just for free speech and just open discourse in general. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's one of the one of the really central issues of our time is going to be sorting that out, not just in the academy, but everywhere. You know, I the, we've been making jokes this whole time. Like we're just straight up not allowed to talk about certain things, not because we have dangerous ideas about them, but because the discussion itself is off limits um, in certain parts of our society. And you know, science is just one of those, but I, I think this is a huge, huge mistake that we shouldn't be making because, like you said, not only do really good ideas come out of these kind of crazy, dark, shadowy spaces sometimes, but even when there's bad ideas that come out, what a better way to deal with a bad idea than to air it out on the table and just, you know, shred it publicly as rationally as we can, as opposed to just tucking it away in a cave somewhere where it's going to fester and boil. So, yeah, yeah. And if we and if we make entire segments of the scientific, um, like body of knowledge off limits, we just we're like asking ourselves to be extinct. Like some other culture that allows free discourse will pick it up and they will make all the discoveries and we'll make ourselves irrelevant. And it, and it's sad, but I honestly think that's kind of the way that the West is heading. Like there's there's amazing discoveries coming out of other countries and other cultures right now, and. I mean, th this gets almost a little bit political, but I think that that we are almost kind of like heading downhill just a teeny bit. I hope that we turn it around and that the future 
might look so different than what we think it's going to look like because the future might not be ours. It, it might be these, these exploding populations in Africa, in the Middle East, in India, and what their cultural ideology brings to the scientific table is going to actually steer scientific thought in the same way that ours has, you know, that the future. It could, and it could be cyclic too, right? I mean, the West has gone down before. I think people forget that, but you know, if you go, if you go to Washington, DC, like it basically looks like Rome, all the architecture is the same. The basic organization of the legal structures are the same. The law language is in Latin. I mean, it's basically Rome 2.0 and like, it's not unreasonable to expect that it'll be 3.4.5. You know, we're going to have like the iPhone 1200 eventually. So, um, yeah, it's interesting how, how those cycles appear. But I think that you're right that science is, is a shifting game. And it's going to be really interesting because right now I think everybody takes for granted that everything is published in English that is worth reading. And I think about this all the time. I, I, like, I have access to Russian papers. I have access to French papers. But that's it. Right? I can't read something that comes out of a Chinese university or a Japanese or a German or whatever. And so there's all these ideas that are locked away. And if, if English doesn't remain the, the de facto language of discovery, then that's an accelerating, that's an accelerating down. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I wish like I could take my stuff and translate it into like Spanish and Arabic and Chinese because I I see such like strong kind of control and an opposition to any kind of pull shift idea, even though I think it's obvious that sometimes I, I feel a little bit like, oh, maybe the, the West isn't going to accept this, but maybe another culture will, you know, because all you have to do is see it. All you have to do is see that globe with that ice cap so completely off center. And it's like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up on that dream. Like it might be very well possible you can. I, I know like a, a few YouTubers have just completely like tripled their audience by doing that kind of thing, by just very simply translating their episodes into other languages. Um, yeah. Or I mean, like you can hire a translator for the blog. Like this is, this seems yeah, like a Yeah, it can happen dream. for sure. I think it's a, a really, really good idea. I want to do that eventually too. Because we have a lot of people that have mentioned that scientific ideas are easier accepted in other countries. Like uh, we've had people on the show who are like, you know, I've been invited to Moscow University to give talks, but people in America won't, they'll like <laughs> laugh me out of a room. Right. <laughs> out of a university. Like, yeah. So it's, there's definitely a lot of really crazy things that are happening. Um, uh, we are verging on hour three, though. And so I think that we should we should put a pin in it. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. It's been really fun to talk to you. That's fantastic. Yeah. Super, super good to talk about these things. So yeah, I really look for like what. Uh, so you're we'll, we'll put your website uh, in the description. Is there any other place where people can find you and, you know. How are they going to, how do they book a tour when they come through out there? How, how, you know. <laughs> so all my, like my personal stuff is at utahgeology.com. So where my article on this is and, and the pole shift ideas, but then my professional website, which I, I don't say anything about this more fringe stuff about is geology.utah.gov. So that's the state geological survey. And that's all down the line. I'm um, just typical geology. And I've got a number of articles on there, mainly on like sites in Utah and how they're formed and, but yeah, and my tour stuff is on my utahgeology.com too. Very nice. Nice. Cool, man. Well, that was, su I got so much to think about. My, my brain is full. Yeah, we'll but, catch up again. Yeah, let, let's, let's, uh, let's see what happens down the road and, and look for some changes. Maybe we can, can uh, meet up and talk about them again. Awesome. Awesome.